Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Kreitz. I uh, am from the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology, and I would like to welcome all of you today to day three of our Win Waterloo AI workshop. To open today's session, I would like to introduce Professor Mark Giesbrecht, Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Waterloo. Professor Giesbrecht. Thank you, Lisa. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening uh, to conference participants joining us from Canada, uh, France, and other countries around the world. Um, as Lisa said, my name is Mark Giesbrecht. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Waterloo, and I'm a professor at the Cheriton School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. It's my honor today to introduce today's keynote speaker, Wilfred Vanderbilt, here on the third day of the AI for Science and Engineering workshop. Congratulations and special thanks to Waterloo AI and the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology for hosting this event. And thank you to the organizers and colleagues at the University of Bordeaux for furthering the research collaboration between our institutions, a partnership that is now formally in its 11th year these kinds of meetings are always a productive and invigorating partnership, like the one between Waterloo and Bordeaux, certainly needs to be celebrated as an amazing success. Over that time, this past decade or so, machine learning and AI has taken a massive step forward. I still remember as a new student in computer science and mathematics, and I guess that's almost four decades ago now, when AI was new and on the fringes. And I truly admired those who pushed and pursued it to its current success. Today in our Faculty of Mathematics, that potential is being realized as machine learning and AI are integral to so many research projects in computer science, applied math, and combinatorics and optimization. We see AI and machine learning in diverse fields like human-computer interaction, security, ecology, and climate, and mathematical and healthcare and medicine, to name but a few. Now we are coming to realize the potential of AI and machine learning and quantum computing and nanotechnology has been, as has been illustrated so brilliantly in the past two days of this conference so far. It's an exciting time as me for Dean of Math and Professor of Computer Science to witness this flowering of AI and machine learning and the impact this is having on the world. I also want to thank and acknowledge our colleagues in industry who are joining us today and whose partnership and collaboration has done so much to foster the spirit of innovation and entre entrepreneurship in the Faculty of Mathematics and the School of Computer Science, something which is in our DNA and something which we are so very proud of over the past five decades. Whether it's through the many startups and spin-off ventures our researchers have founded or through research commercialization, the bridges we build with industry are vitally important for getting our work to the people who need it, into the hands of developers and engineers, and then into the communities who put them to use. In the context of the pandemic, for example, research industry partnerships have flourished into innovations in testing technology, in the ongoing development of second generation vaccines, and in contact tracing and data analyses. Indeed, it is, it is with respect to this notion of real world impact that Professor Vanderbilt's research seems to me so timely as the practical application for a new generation of powerful, energy efficient nanocomputing technology is immense. It is my privilege to introduce his keynote address here. Professor Bonderville is a full professor of nanoelectronics and director of the Center for Brain-Inspired Nanosystems at the University of Trenta, the Netherlands. He holds a second professorship at the Institute of Physics at the University of Munster in Germany. His research focuses on unconventional electronics for efficient information processing. Bonderville is a is a pioneer in machine, material learning at the nanoscale, realizing computational functionality and artificial intelligence in designless nanomaterial substrates through principles analogous to machine learning. The Center for Brain-Inspired Nanosystems, which he directs, was established in 2018, combining core expertise in nanoscience and nanotechnology with expertise from computer science, applied mathematics, artificial intelligence, and neuroscience. With that, I welcome you and look forward to your talk, Professor Bondadil. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gietbrecht, and uh, thank you all organizers uh, for uh, for having me here at uh, this uh, fascinating workshop. Can you hear me okay? Okay, excellent. Um, well, again, thanks a lot. It's uh, really my pleasure uh, to uh, to join this workshop. Uh, also, special thanks to uh, Professor Jushanta Mitra, who uh, brought this uh, event to my uh, attention and uh, facilitated also uh, the talk uh, uh, that I can give here uh, uh, this morning uh, for you. Um, I'll uh, discuss a topic uh, that we have dubbed uh, material learning, which is, of course, uh, some analogon of uh, machine learning. And uh, in the coming uh, 45 minutes or so, I would like to uh, to yeah, make to clarify what we uh, what we mean by that. Uh, I can't see uh, your comments or uh, or hands raised. So please, if you have a question, please interrupt me uh, by just speaking up, and uh, I'm happy to to answer questions in the middle if that's also allowed by the organizers. Uh, that's fine what we'll then. What uh, we do is um, we will read, the, they'll uh, put the questions in the, our chat box and we'll okay. be able to, um, uh, they'll be able to, I'll be able to ask at the end, so probably just keep it going. Uh, oh, okay, so that, that's uh, that's better. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, unless it really becomes not clear, then maybe it's better to, to stop me. Okay, I realize it's still uh, it's an uneven battle here, but it's uh, still a bit uh, early in the morning for you guys. Uh, I'll I'll start uh, uh, with uh, introducing my uh, colleagues. That's uh, normally something that uh, I now put in the at the beginning of my talk because otherwise at the end uh, uh, I won't have time for that. And uh, this is actually the most important slide I want to show because it wants to make clear that this is. A really a um, um, very large group effort and not only that also very diverse uh, uh, group uh, effort uh, with uh, many disciplines involved ranging from applied physics electrical engineering computer science and machine learning and uh, even chemistry uh, so really broad uh, broad uh, a group and of course i shouldn't forget to maybe mention specifically nanotechnology and nanoscience uh, as uh, as well um, so I think this this venue of of combining uh, your AI and the Nanotechnology Institute is is really nice to to share our results because uh, that's also what we try to do to to kind of find the syn synergy between these uh, two uh, large research areas. Yes. So again, uh, I know it's early uh, for you, but I, I still want to confront you with uh, a little mathematical uh, puzzle uh, without using your Blackberries, iPhones, or other uh calculation aids um could some of you please solve this little puzzle for me and uh, this is all in the framework of interactive education as we like to promote also at our university so if you have an idea uh, what the answer is of this little uh, multiplication please speak up now i hope that's allowed by the organizers but i could also imagine that is not completely trivial. Um, so if there are no answers, then I'll share the answer with you. Is this, I mean, this is not the, 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 the worst mathematical problem ever, right? But still, I mean, uh, I have to admit also for me, I, uh, I had to use my small pocket calculator for uh, for solving this uh, a little bit timely. But now I would like to ask you to pay attention very carefully because what's coming next. And I hope that came across well also via Teams. Uh, but maybe uh, one of um, uh, OK, only if I chat. Yeah, I hope that uh, some of uh, of you could and put in the chat what he or she just uh, said. What 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 you just could could see on the on the slide. So if you if you notice something uh, which I just flashed for you, please put it in the please put it in the chat. Anyone noticed something in the last couple of seconds on the slide? I think nobody noticed anything so maybe i should just try it again anyone
no one did notice anything, but uh, I can then share this. A photo, yes, Lisa, excellent. And what's on the photo? Anything particularly you noticed on this photo? A man in a restaurant, that's already quite specific. Yeah, anyone else? I realize it's still a little bit early morning for you guys, but uh, a man in a restaurant. I uh, will we'll, we'll keep it. Uh, we'll keep it like that. Uh, actually, it is a man, a rather young man at the time. It's actually me being in a, a cubicle in uh, in Japan. Uh, not yeah. There are some mandarins there, so maybe that made you think uh, it's uh, it's kind of restaurant. But uh, it was uh, it was the office. Exactly. Uh, some people notice that actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, so the point I want to make basically, and uh, yeah, it's not so easy over Teams, uh, I admit, um, is that uh, doing a relatively simple calculation for us is quite an effort. Whereas on the other hand, flashing a uh, photograph with you for only a fraction of time, or at least do it twice maybe, is, uh, is something for us that we can uh, well recognize rather easily and interpret uh, pretty precisely, even given that uh, that short time. So our brain is uh, very good, and that's the point I would like to make at interpreting the outside world uh, in in, in uh, finding very fast strategies to maybe escape from a predator or something like this, but not really very optimized for doing logical operations or computations and, and the stuff that that even simple uh, pocket calculators can do rather rather well. And of course, now our present day uh, uh, processors, uh, CPUs, uh, all the all the chips we have in our uh, computers and smartphones and so on are extremely uh, optimized and very good at, at doing exactly uh, exactly that. Um, so there's a clear difference between basically the information processing that we uh, we do in our brain, as you of course very much aware of. Um, uh, so there there is a clear distinction. But what I also would like to stress is that there is a very clear distinction in power consumption. Yeah, on the one hand, we have uh, these uh, man-made processors that consume on the order of uh, 100 watt, and uh, there is our brain that typically operates at, uh, at 20 watt. And if you try to make a comparison between the typical amount of operations that, uh, that we do per second and what the chip can do, you see that there is actually still a gap. So if you would like to make a fair comparison, maybe you would arrive here for man-made technology somewhere in the in the well megawatt regime even so apparently our brain can do quite uh, an amazing job for a certain amount of uh, certain kind of uh, operations i uh, i should say so it's therefore not uh, surprising that for um for implementing um artificial uh, neural networks for, for machine learning, artificial intelligence, we start looking not only for the algorithms, but also for the uh, hardware at uh, how the brain is uh, is organized. And then we start to see that there are quite uh, uh, important differences. We see that, for example, in the brain, there is very uh, clear co-localization of memory in processing in the form of the uh, neural synapses. Uh, in the man-made technology, we have a clear separation between memory and processing uh, dictated by the von Neumann architecture, where basically we have a separate memory and processor. We also see that um, the, there is a very decentral processor. There is this kind of central conductor uh, which um, which sets the pace and basically the, uh, the, the, the chip is operating purely sequentially, one operation after the other, very fast admittedly at a single component, at a single transistor level, but still basically sequential. Whereas in the brain, many things happen at the same time and the individual uh, building blocks, the neurons are relatively slow yeah, because you can benefit from, on the one hand, this, this massive parallelism uh, that is enabled uh, by um, uh, by this um, uh, ma many connections that you have per neuron and at the same time also this co-localization of uh, of memory and processing. 
So clear differences uh, there, and uh, that's uh, basically the main motivation uh, for looking at um, at the brain uh, to implement um, things like this neural uh, neural network. So I'm pretty sure, definitely, the people with, from the AI Institute that you are uh, very very knowledgeable about uh, these uh, neural networks, these model systems that nowadays are referred to to deep neural networks. If you have many hidden layers, uh, which are of course loosely based on uh, on real biological neural networks. We have the artificial neurons here, which I've here zoomed out, interconnect, uh, represented by uh, these uh, black lines. And the amazing thing is that uh, through a learning process, uh, finding the weights and the biases of these artificial neurons, these systems uh, can solve uh, very important problems um, that were also the uh, we as humans are good at so classification, pattern recognition, face recognition more uh, specifically, only by uh, finding the uh, uh, weights and biases of this network, uh, using admittedly uh, tons of data uh, to to train this and finally uh, enable inference of unseen uh, of unseen data. So um, there is definitely a way uh, to uh, to improve the hardware for uh, for these uh, systems, uh, because as you can imagine, for uh, treating all these data, for training all these weights, a, a massive amount of uh, calculations, multiplications have to uh, be done, and especially this von Neumann architecture, where data has to be shuffled between a processor and memory is very unfavorable and wasteful for that uh, task. And that is uh, illustrated here in uh, this overview where we basically see uh, computational time in petaflops per second times days versus uh, here the time axis, where you see that the amount of um, time that is used for training AI systems basically kept pace with the development of Moore's law of hardware for a long time, for multiple decades. But in the last few years, we see that there is uh, quite a mismatch between uh, what is needed to train these new AI systems. Maybe you know AlphaGo uh, as a uh, uh, famous example um, and, and, and other re uh, relatively new AI systems. You really see that the amount of time that is needed to train those systems doubles uh, at a much faster pace uh, than uh, the, the the hardware can, uh, uh, at least conventional Moore's law dictated hardware can uh, keep up with. So therefore, uh, kind of the uh, yeah common uh, um, agreement that uh, it's not only algorithms that we should focus on in this uh, AI. Uh, technology, but definitely also hardware because simply uh, things get unsustainable and especially if you would like to implement AI in the edge, uh, uh, local, delocalized, so decentralized in self-driving cars, in smartphones, Internet of Things, places where you can't rely on uh, large data centers or, or so. Uh, there it's of course of crucial importance that you have uh, hardware that uh, that is energy efficient, that is fast, and also has a low low latency. So that's the overall motivation uh, why we uh, would like to work on this uh, huge problem of developing new kinds of hardware for a, uh, AI. Well, um, there are many people um, that uh, come up with uh, with concepts and hardware ideas how to realize that uh, there are some concepts that stay relatively close uh, to the model uh, where uh, for example this model of artificial neural networks deep neural networks where uh, basically uh, there are efficient ways uh, used for doing matrix vector uh, multiplications that are used a lot in these artificial neural networks so basically linear operations carried out in materials um, very uh, successful in that area are uh, memristor crossbar arrays uh, so they are very um, very powerful in uh, co-localizing memory and processing uh, by programmable uh, conductances basically but they follow still very closely basically the architecture of these uh, of these models what I'm going to talk about today is uh, even more loosely uh, related to the underlying uh, 
uh, neural networks, we would like uh, to basically go and not to systems where we still have components that are identifiable with the individual components of neural networks, artificial neural networks. I would like to go more to a distributed way of computing in material substrates in order to arrive at hopefully more efficient and powerful hardware for AI. And that's where I get to this topic of material learning. So, uh, of course, you are uh, familiar with biological learning, if you like to put it like, uh, like this. We have talked about machine learning, which is basically model building, still software. And I'm going to talk about now directly trying to apply principles of learning uh, in uh, material substrates. In order uh, to, to do something meaningful there, we, we need, a, of course, a certain kind of materials. Eh? So it's, it's, it's not that every uh, piece of uh, chewing gum or so could maybe be used for, uh, for, uh, for, for learning and for doing uh, efficient information processing. So uh, what are the kind of the minimum um, ingredients that you need to, to have a material substrate where you can do things like and computing or information processing with. And we laid that out uh, recently in this, uh, this perspective paper where we indicated, well, we should at least have materials that have the ability to, to, to sense, to actuate, uh, to have some long-term memory so that basically the material can learn from uh, previous experiences. And finally, we need also a kind of feedback system. So we need a network in which internally in this material um, information can be can be fed back and uh, that uh, that intelligent uh, some some kind of intelligent decisions can be made also based on the input of multiple uh, maybe multiple sensory information and not unimportantly also the aspect of non-linearity is uh, is crucial because if you want to do some meaningful information processing non-linearity is uh, is of uh, importance um, I don't have time to go into this uh, whole background of intelligent matter in detail, but as I said, this is uh, outlined in this, uh, this paper. So a couple of years ago, before we even actually kind of clearly defined these necessary elements of intelligent matter, we thought ourselves, uh, well, if we want to do something functional with nanomaterials, what could we use as a building block and a kind of um, yeah, um, maybe opportunistically, uh, we looked at the stuff that we were working uh, on uh, on uh, for some years at that time, and that was single electron transistors. So um, maybe for the nanotechnology people, uh, this uh, this uh, looks familiar. These are uh, nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, about 20 nanometer in diameter, and using some molecular glue, some some molecular uh, binders we were able to make these assemblies of nanorods. These are gold nanorods uh, connected to a nanoparticle here, and again, another nanorod. And then by top-down lithography, by e-beam lithography, we we're, were able to make uh, electron, um, yeah, electrodes to them so that we could uh, also measure electron transport through these uh, nanoscale islands that are isolated from the leads uh, by these molecular uh, barriers that, uh, that serve as external barriers. So if you look at the transport through such a system, uh, it's described by Coulomb blockade physics, which is classical physics in essence, and which has to do with the fact that if you have such a small uh, metallic island, you start to notice, notice the electrostatic repulsion between individual electrons on this island. So what you get is that the electronic landscape of this uh, metal starts to change from a continuum to a set of discrete electrostatic potential levels that you see here. Again, that's purely due to classical Coulomb uh, repulsion, where the separation between these levels is given by the so-called charging energy, which is again related to the overall capacitance of this island. And if you measure transport uh, through this, then you will see that you will only have transport through the island if one of these uh, discrete levels aligns with your bias window. You see a very sharp peak in the conductance or the current through this island. 
but you can basically shut off the transistor completely by moving up or down the ladder of discrete levels a little bit so that you are in Coulomb blockade. There's not enough energy to hop on or hop off the island. And it's called a single electron transistor because uh, in this regime, only one electron at a time can tunnel uh, through uh, this island. So you have very well uh, behaved and, and clearly uh, described uh, system um, that we know uh, that we know very well, basically from textbook physics. And we thought, okay, this is an interesting building block because here we have something that is highly nonlinear. Uh, we can uh, basically make a network out of it and we can see uh, it, 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 it is uh, adjustable by electric voltages, currents, and we can also read out in the form of, uh, of currents. The big disadvantage, of course, and this is the reason why this is really an academic exercise, is that we have to do this at very low temperatures uh, in order to meet the requirement that the charging energy should be larger than KBT, the thermal energy. I'll come back to that uh, later on, but just for as a disclaimer uh, that this is not something that you will see soon in your mobile phone or so. So like I said, uh, we wanted to go to a very much disordered network of these things. So to bring in also this network and feedback uh, possibility. And well, the, the wild question was basically, can we make a, a functional device, uh, device out of this disordered nanoparticle system? And of course, where we had a very clear physical mathematical description, if you like, of a single particle system, uh, there is no way that we can a priori describe the behavior of this system. So we should, uh, if in order to, to, to find some functional behavior to make uh, what we'll show is uh, that uh, to, to make a logic gate out of it, for example, uh, we need a way to find a configuration of the system, a setting of the system that gives us the desired behavior. And we don't have a recipe for that. So how do we go about that? There comes in uh, this method that is uh, called evolution in material, which is uh, a kind of genetic, a kind of uh, yeah, genetic approach, genetic, genetic algorithm. Uh, it's also referred to, but applied directly to a material substrate. And you will see that it will have very interesting and, and close analogies with real evolution and sexual reproduction as we know it. Uh, from uh, Darwinian evolution. So the central idea uh, is as follows. We take our material system, uh, which can be any interesting system, uh, interesting meaning what we would call intelligent matter, uh, where we apply a physical input and we read out a physical output under a certain uh, physical configuration. So that could be in our language, it could be control voltages. Then we still have to use a regular computer to basically read out this data and compare the actual output with a certain desired output. So for example, you want to make an inverter. So you have a high input, you want to have a low output. Then you compare it with this desired output and you assign a certain fitness to it. So how well does your input output relationship represent your desired output? And uh, here you get a number based on that. Eh? So it could be kind of at least square error fit or, or whatever. Based on that uh, outcome, you start to reshuffle basically the physical configurations that you apply to this material. And so in general, what you do, you start with a number of configurations, all with a number of individual numbers, control voltages, for example, we call them genes. And now in the next iteration, what we start to do is to combine kind of crossbreed, basically configurations in line with uh, genetics. We start to uh, introduce mutations. We start to select. So we pick out the configurations that perform best and those we move to the next generation and we try them out again. So instead of doing a brute force uh, trial and error search, we basically try to use the best uh, trials that we had from a former generation. We try to intermix them. We, uh, in a controlled way, we ch ch uh, change them a bit using these mutations. So explore the uh, search space a bit more. And uh, in the next generation, we go again through this process of input output and comparing with the desired output 
and so on. So this is a, a way to basically speed up uh, the search for, uh, for functionality in basically what we could call a black box uh, system. Uh, there we go again. Uh, this is our uh, nanoparticle network. What we did is here in this exercise trying to realize uh, Boolean logic, two input, one output Boolean logic. And here's an example uh, specifically for the end gate. And the truth table of the end gate, as you know, it should only give an high if both inputs are high. And so here's the truth table for the end. And um, the way that we um, we feed inputs to our system is here by voltages. So we have a, a, a voltage pulse train where this corresponds to one zero, zero one, zero zero, and one one. So basically the desired output here in the current space uh, should be only a high current out if both inputs are high and otherwise it should be low. So how do we do it? Here we have the inputs, here we have the output and the rest of the electrodes and also the substrate is, um, is, uh, is used as control. And the controls are indicated here as these kind of artificial genes. You see here we are not really there yet, but here we have a reasonable solution that follows nicely the desired shape. So we said, okay, this uh, individual, this uh, finally configuration is fit enough uh, for purpose and uh, we uh, accept that as a solution. That's what we did, uh, not only for uh, for the end gate, but actually also uh, for all possible two input, uh, one output logic gate. And uh, what you see here is uh, inverters. So basically what we could show is that in one and the same device at this very low temperature, admittedly, uh, we could realize any Boolean logic gate in one and the same device without any a priori design. Yeah, so this, this, this device is being learned uh, in situ and we can reconfigure it. So that's, that's nice, uh, but academic. So what we like to do is we want to move to a system that we can operate at higher temperature, but also we would like to have a system that is more compatible with standard electronics. And that's why we move to this silicon system, which in essence has the same kind of geometry. We have a central region of about 200, 300 nanometer, very similar to the nanoparticle network. But now we don't have nanoparticles, but we have dopants. We have atoms implanted in silicon that form our disordered network. But again, we can apply voltages as input. We can read out currents as output and we control the potential landscape of, uh, of this network by control voltages, because that's basically the name of the game. We control the potential landscape such that we get the desired input output relationship. Yeah, so that's how we look at it. We not physically change the position or the configuration of these particles. Now we only play with the uh, potential landscape so that we get into a situation that the current trajectories reflect uh, the, the functionality that we would like to realize. So the physics is, uh, is slightly different in this system. We do not have these single electron transistors, uh, although the physics is quite related. We have now variable range hopping from one uh, atomic dopant side to the other. But again, what is crucial is that we have this non-linearity in the basic characteristics. If we measure the IV characteristics between uh, two electrodes, we see this non-linearity. And that's what we thrive on uh, to realize non-trivial functionality uh, like, like these Boolean logic gates. I'll skip over the, the details of the device. Please ask me about it if you're interested about the, the underlying fabrication and so on. Um, to cut a long story short, we were able to also get uh, this uh, Boolean logic gates uh, in, in this silicon-based device, but now at much higher temperature. Uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, which is of course still very impractical, but already much nicer to work with than uh, these sub Kelvin temperatures for us experimentally. And by pushing a little bit uh, the device, we could realize also these gate at room temperature, but you can see they are still rather noisy. So there's work to be done and we have to probably change the nature of these um, 
uh, dopant atoms to, to arrive at, at a robust room temperature operation. So you could say, well, uh, what, what, what is really exciting about Boolean logic? We know how to make Boolean logic already for a long time, so why do we need this, this very complicated and strange devices for it? And that's maybe, uh, well, maybe illustrated a little bit by, um, uh, by this uh, comparison that, uh, that you can look at the XOR uh, Boolean logic cake also as a as a classification problem. So basically what you see here is a graphical representation of XOR. You see it's only high if one and only one of the inputs is high, yeah, indicated by a red dot. You could also ask uh, and, and consider this as a classification problem and say, well, how to separate these two classes of blue boxes and, and red dots? And you'll see that it's impossible to find a straight line that separates these two classes. So you need something like this, yeah? and that's why we call this a linearly inseparable uh, classification problem. You need some nonlinear decision boundary. And what you could do is now say, well, let's transform this, this problem to a higher dimension, uh, to the fur dimension in this case, and you can find a plane here with again basically a linear structure that now is able to separate the two. And now it becomes a very easy and linearly separable problem. So in classification, this is a trick that is, uh, is often played, basically blowing up uh, the dimensions in order to make a complicated uh, classification problem in, in lower dimension easier, uh, read linearly separable in, in higher dimensional space. Of course, the crux is to find this transformation, which is, which is a, a nonlinear transformation and also uh, takes takes computational uh, resources. So, how how to do this is is not non-trivial. So, one of the ideas is uh, that we had is why not taking our device basically uh, to to do it, and and we think that's basically what what our device would be good at because it's it's in essence a non-linear uh, non-linear device. So um, here again, uh, the picture is that we have this XOR gate. Uh, where the inputs are fed to two of these input gates. We have the controls, which are these gray electrodes, and the yellow uh, electrode represents um, the output. And only uh, as a function of these different inputs under the given configuration, you see that the potential landscape of our network changes such that we realize uh, the truth table of the XOR, or in other words, wh whether we can solve this nonlinear uh, classification problem. So how can we uh, use that uh, in, a, in a more elaborate way? I'll turn on the light here because it's getting dark. Uh, and uh, we, we took as a benchmark task this, this MNIST handwritten digit database that uh, I guess uh, many of you are familiar with. About 70,000 handwritten uh, digits, 60,000 to train, 10,000 to, to test your, your uh, artificial neural network system, and we use it now for our uh, device. Um, so uh, uh, what we did was basically uh, trying to realize a feature extractor uh, using our uh, nanoscale device. Maybe you are uh, familiar with this famous experiment by Hubel and Wiesel where they saw uh, that the visual cortex of this cat is very sensitive to very particular orientations of a, of a, of a feature here. They saw that only for a certain angle, you get very high response in a, in a, in a certain area of this, uh, of this visual cortex. And uh, that basically also tells that biological neural networks have very specific feature extractors that react uh, to, to certain uh, inputs. And that's we try to realize, of course, in a very uh, simple, basic way, also with our devices in the following way. Since the number of inputs is limited, we base ourselves on four uh, pixel inputs, so basically two by two structures, where we uh, programmed our uh, device to uh, react specifically to one of the 16 possibilities of inputs that you can have. So all white or all black or something in between. So we had to, to find 16 different configurations for that. 
then we build that in in a uh, kind of uh, hybrid algorithm where we use partly our device and where we partly use a computer-based linear classifier to help to blow up this uh, dimensional space that I explained to you uh, before in the simple XOR problem. So basically we scan a whole digit of this MNIST data set and every time we multiply in a way with all the 16 possible uh, feature extractors, so blowing up uh, this whole uh, dimensional space. And finally, uh, let a linear classifier, standard linear classifier, do the job to label the input of these, uh, of these uh, digits. So what we found uh, is that by doing that, uh, we could definitely uh, increase the accuracy uh, of, uh, of the overall uh, scheme. So what you see here is uh, basically a confusion matrix, which tells around the diagonal when uh, digits are labeled correctly and off diagonal is incorrectly. Uh, so we basically see that there are relatively high numbers here for correct labeling, 96%. And we compare that to the situation where you would only use a linear uh, classifier. And you see there is a significant uh, improvement. On the other hand, if you compare to state-of-the-art deep neural networks, which really go uh, full power uh, in software, you see there's still some way uh, to go. What we hope, however, is that using devices like ours, we can do that more efficiently uh, in, in time and also in energy, uh, basically uh, benefiting from the parallelism and the um, non-linearity that, uh, that we get uh, get for free kind of in, in our hardware. All right, um, could I just maybe get from the organizers uh, an indication of how many minutes there are left, if there are any minutes left? Because I think I'm approaching. Um, let me uh, continue by, by, by saying that uh, while well, we have used this evolutionary approach, which is uh, quite powerful, but also quite uh, time consuming. And remember that we have to do that for every uh, individual device because no device is uh, the same. Three minutes. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Um, so we have thought of alternatives to, to train our devices uh, maybe more, more efficiently. And um, well, this is still an intermediate solution, uh, but interesting uh, on it in itself, I think. Uh, and this is by building an, a kind of software clone. So really a surrogate model of our physical device. So what we have done here is based on tons of input output data. We have built up a neural network like a standard deep neural network uh, that talks and walks like our physical device. And that's basically what neural networks are very good at, at basically uh, reproducing uh, real life uh, systems. But now what we had, have done, so now we basically only have the, the, the clone, if you like, of our device. But of course, we don't have any functionality yet. So now the trick is to use this surrogate model to find functionality. So basically we have to find uh, the control the controls, the external control voltages that tune this network into a functional device. So we keep basically the, the, the weights and the, the, the internal structure of the neural network the same, but we are trying to find now uh, control voltages uh, and, and use those as the learnable parameters in, in this way. And once we found uh, these uh, settings for a certain functionality, so for example, an XOR gate, we go with these value back to the physical device and apply them uh, and see whether the physical device actually works. And the big advantage of this approach is that we can use basically standard machine learning algorithms uh, to optimize it. So we can use backpropagation, gradient descent, all these standard things that people are using in machine learning uh, because we now have a mathematical description of our uh, physical device that we didn't have before. So here uh, you see an example that we could solve another classification problem, an, a more difficult one, uh, like two classes of data, one in the center and one in the periphery. We could find the, uh, the decision boundary, basically the circular decision boundary based on the output current. So high output current means, okay, you're part of this central class. 
low output current means you are in the periphery. So we can basically solve this highly uh, nonlinear classification problem using now the power of uh, machine learning applied to the surrogate model of our device. And uh, here another example that we could do is basically making feature extractors with one and the same device and also the one in the same setting. So based on a learned uh, protocol, one and the same device under the same configuration can now recognize 16 different features by assigning um, a different current levels to it. So it's, it's a kind of data reduction scheme that we can realize in this device now. OK, so let me use the last few seconds of my talk by introducing yet another possible uh, learning scheme uh, that we are working on uh, in the, at the moment, uh, which is basically trying to do this gradient descent that normally people do in software models directly in the material itself. And the way that we do it is by applying a small perturbation to the DC inputs of our device. Then we look at this perturbated output and we filter out again using basically a lock-in amplifier technique. We filter out these different frequencies, these perturbations. And using this lock-in technology, we can basically calculate the gradient with respect to the individual uh, perturbations. Yeah. So um, the, the nice thing is that we can even do that in parallel if we separate the frequencies wisely. We can basically calculate the gradient, we can multiply by the error uh, function derivative and finally find an update for the settings. So we can iteratively on the go in a uh, device uh, update its setting to get to functionality based on an error function without invoking an external computer. And we have shown that also in this way we can uh, realize, for example, Boolean logic. I'm out of time, uh, so let me very quickly summarize that I hope that I've made a little bit clear what we mean by material learning, that we can basically use the intrinsic and nonlinear physics of materials to compute and do hopefully useful stuff. Uh, the interesting thing is that we do not need a priori design and we can even tolerate some minor defects which is interesting especially at the nanoscale and hopefully this will uh, lead to small footprint and high efficiency hardware for tasks like machine learning and ai in general thank you very much for your attention oh thank you professor van der Veel for this uh wow fascinating information packed uh, uh presentation um i'm going to ask our our tech support has, uh, do we have a few questions ready to go? As we are running short on time. Uh, Jacob, uh, while we're waiting, actually, perhaps we only have this one. Um, I apologize, I am not an expert in AI or computation. I uh, um, am fascinated by it. I tried to learn as much as possible, um, but I, I think I need someone who is a little bit more um, I don't know, <laughs> started the kindergarten phases with myself. What I love is you've actually gone into what the problem is with the hardware that we're needing and with, especially with our, our mobile lifestyle now. Well, maybe not with COVID so much, but uh, so exactly. Um, so we've seen a lot of the, the schematics and the design. Where are we now with respect to um, the state of the technology and how long will it take when I can actually walk around with my cell phone and say like, OK, absolutely everything that I need. I can have like uh, uh, the quickest, fastest decisions, the best optimization, things like that. I hope my question made sense. <laughs> Yeah, it's a brilliant question, and uh, well, the, no one's the, ever the, called my question brilliant before. <laughs> the, the, and, and, and normally, the, the most difficult questions come from people who are a little bit or far outside the, the field. I think it's it's an excellent question, and uh, well, maybe I can just illustrate it. That uh, well, I admit the the route that we are taking is 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 a kind of exotic. But like big uh, industrial uh, players like, uh, well, you know them, um, the Microsoft, the Apples and so on, uh, IBM, uh, they are already uh, making and selling chips that are uh, doing this brain inspired designs. They don't go all the way that they go completely to materials based learning, but they use very often 
standard technology to make very non-standard architectures. And to give you an example, for example, uh, Siri um, uh, on your on your iPhone. If you if you do a request, what was done till very recently is was it was sent to the cloud, which means basically a, a data center somewhere. And, and a couple of these requests were, were batched and then processed by a very large scale computer and then the answer came back. So the, the, the AI part was basically in a centralized part. Now by, by introducing uh, neuromorphic chips or AI uh, chips, uh, the power is now also to do that locally so that you can do it much faster, but it's only a very recent development, maybe of the last half year or so. So you see that also uh, yeah, basically it's entering your life today. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Uh, I'm not saying that our technology will be there tomorrow because we are also as scientists kind of pushed in, in really more farther horizons because it's also industry that, that is working on this very hard. So we try to maybe take the next next steps in order to, to, to make it even more energy efficient and more, uh, well, uh, smaller and low latency. Smaller, faster, cheaper, lighter. It's almost like the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was right. wonderful. Oh, go ahead, please. I know I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I'm oh, okay. just looking whether there are any other questions. I think it's um, uh, early in the morning, but also we are just just uh, over time. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see here. We have two questions now published. Um, let me see here. I don't see uh, Oleg and Jacob. I don't see them. What I'm thinking, because we are just pushing over time, what we can do is I can forward you, Professor uh, Vanderveel, the uh, questions, and then we can somehow get uh, the answers uh, responded to uh, the the those who have asked. And I see them now, and I can. Oh, uh, can you I see can them? Oh, them please go ahead. Well, I don't know if there's time. Other, otherwise, I'm happy to do them offline. I don't want to eat up. 30 seconds each and then we can go. <laughs> okay, uh, first question from Yimin Wu. What is the energy efficient of your device comparing to the crossbar memristor? So the, if I have to give a short answer, uh, the number that we estimated, but we uh, is really projected is 100 tera operations per uh, watt. Uh, so tera operations per second per watt. So that maybe gives you a ballpark figure. Details uh, can be found in, in, in the paper. Um, what is the, an anonymous question, what is the practical application of these, of these learning? I'm not sure I really understand the question, but uh, the learning is, uh, okay, so practical, it's, it's really, uh, if I understand correctly, this is a very powerful approach for for, for classification, uh, image recognition, uh, for example, s autonomous driving uh, very quickly, basically doing the stuff that our brain is also uh, very uh, good at. I hope that answers the question. Otherwise, please feel free to contact me offline. Oh, that's wonderful. I bet you will get uh, a few questions uh, offline because uh, your talk was just uh, um, visually beautiful and so dynamic and so interesting. So. Um, Thank you, Lisa. It was wonderful to get to meet you. Uh, hopefully we can invite Likewise. you to Canada Canada soon because we want to get to the Netherlands soon. Uh, hopefully <laughs> right. our, our, COVID, yeah. our COVID restrictions will lift uh, shortly. It was a delight to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And we'll, we'll see you shortly. <laughs> and next on deck is Professor Mike Michel Fich um, from the University of Waterloo. Um, he is a faculty member at the University of Waterloo since 1986, and he began building telescopes in high school. Um, Professor Feek did his PhD work at the University of California in Berkeley and uh, designed a fabrication of a radio tele telescope receiver system. Uh, since then, he has been involved in numerous other astronomical instruments and telescope uh, projectors that has led him to his this leadership role. Um, and uh, currently he is looking at uh, dark matter in the context of our Milky Way and uh, other observations for galaxies and star formation. Uh, Professor Michael Fick will be speaking on machine learning tools for predicting maintenance requirements on a distant remote controlled facility. Well, you are live, the floor well, is yours. Everybody's probably been looking at my, my uh, slide here. Uh, my title probably should say 
uh, in, in the first few words, should say, uh, looking for help to develop uh, <laughs> uh, machine learning tools. Uh, we're at a very early stage. The picture you're looking at is Photoshop version of this. This facility does not yet exist. Next slide. I can't tell. Did you get to the next slide? Did it work OK? You got my plan of talk? Plan of talk. Yes, that's what we have. Perfect. OK. So I'm mostly going to talk about about the problem and uh, to give you some idea of, of what it is that we're looking at. And um, the, the reason we're looking at this now is because we are expecting operations in about two years. So maybe two or three months ago, we started looking in detail at how we were going to operate this facility. So this is a distant telescope. It's under remote control or even uh, often, in fact, hopefully eventually be just completely automatic control. It'll be a big robot. It'll it'll be a 200 ton robot. And uh, we we are um, trying to figure out how we're going to maintain this and how we're going to uh, operate it in general. The team is an international team, uh, USA, Germany, Canada, Chile, I was the original proponent of this project, but sold it to colleagues in the USA and, and in Germany, and uh, some Chilean people joined us. Um, and I'm going to just talk very briefly at the end about uh, the method, because we really don't have a method. This is something new for us. So next slide, please. So you should be looking at South America with an arrow now that shows uh, roughly where the facility is. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to do a zoom in here, so if you could zoom until the word Tau and CCAT Prime appears, just give it a couple seconds at each zoom step and you can get an idea of where this telescope is located. We're looking for CCAT P and Tau on the same page. So now up here. Yes, we're, Jacob's able to zoom in. OK, so uh, CCAT P, CCAT Prime is our project. And we have partners on the top of this mount, which is the Tokyo Atacama Telescope on the left. And uh, this is, uh, both of these are under construction. The road that's on there is a little bit of an old picture. The road's not there anymore. We've moved the road a bit. Could you move to the next slide just as sort of a summary of beginning of, of what is the problem? Observatory location slide with the arrow. Yes, we've got it. This is, this is the highest man-made structure on the earth. This is higher than either of the base camps for Mount Everest, and they're hardly permanent structures. This is uh, both us and Tau. Tau is actually higher than us. They're 40 meters above us, but our two structures are the highest man-made structures. That's part of the problem. Uh, just by the way, on the right-hand side there, I, I flip between various names. The observatory is called CCAT. This particular project at this observatory site is CCAT Prime and the telescope itself is called Feast for short and you'll see why in a few moments and we are planning to build a larger telescope there in about 10 years or so. Next slide. So here's an artist picture of what our telescope will look like. It's named Fred Young Submillimeter Telescope. That's where the piece comes from. Mr. Young is a very, very generous donor to our American partners and as a consequence, although this was my proposal in the first place, most of the money is coming from Mr. Young and um, that we're, we're Canada is only a 20% partner in this project as a result because well that very generous donation. I'm not complaining. Next slide. This is uh, showing you some of the parts of the telescope and pointing out and this is part of the problem here is that this is 220 tons uh, of moving weight here. Uh, this whole thing rotates. Notice in red the bottom where it says azimuth rotation. Everything above that support cone that's listed, the bottom lowest, lowest coin there, everything above there rotates around that axis. And uh, it rotates very fast and it rotates continuously, uh, accelerating and switching directions uh, frequently. Next slide. Here's a, a cutout showing some of the inside parts on here including the bearings. Notice the elevation bearings here, 50 tons in the other direction. We have to rotate the, the telescope mirrors have to be able to be rotated in both in both directions in azimuth and in elevation. 
And so there's 50 tons of moving weight there. That does not move as frequently as the azimuth moving, uh, uh, and it doesn't move nearly, nearly as far, but it's another one of these moving parts that we have to worry about maintenance on these things, and uh, we're gonna be driving it pretty hard. Next slide. Here's one of the, you know, the telescope motion shown in this picture, but that's not the main one. The main motion is we're moving all the way across the sky, 180 degrees in a minute. And then we reverse direction and move back. And that's the dominant motion. That's probably about 8,000 hours over the next four years will be spent doing just these very rapid scans, moving very quickly all the way around an azimuth and then back again. But there are the other uh, roughly 50% of the time we'll be doing these smaller areas, uh, a few degrees on size, and there we can't move as fast because we're completely limited by the acceleration and jerk that the telescope is capable of doing. But um, we will be moving in a number of different complex patterns to survey the sky. And there's one of them shown in this picture. Next slide. This is a, are you on the slide? I just to check with you. Are you on the slide that says the six meter CCAT prime telescope? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So I, I've just pointed this out, put this up because I want to show you two things. On the left, there is something that says the primary mirror and the secondary mirror. And they're both very large mirrors. Uh, this is actually the key to getting the other thing that I've highlighted on here, the large field of view. This is a survey telescope, but it sees a really large part of the sky at any instant. And of course it's scanning. So we're trying to maximize the amount of sky we see so the big field of view and we scan very fast. Uh, there's lots of things in here in smaller text that don't really matter too much, but let me just say this is a completely original design. No one's ever built a telescope like this before. And that is again part of our challenge in figuring out how, uh, how to use it and, and how to maintain it. The next slide talks a little bit about telescope design. It really should be mirror design should be the title for this slide. Both the primary and secondary mirror are very large. Other telescopes have very small secondaries and a large primary. Each of them, uh, normal in astronomy these days is when you make a large mirror, you need to uh, make it in segments. That's the standard way to make a large mirror, separate aluminum panels in this case, sitting on a carbon fiber reinforced uh, base units below that, and then eventually it connects to steel somewhere. Uh, there's a lot of these separate segments. So another part of the problem is keeping all of these segments aligned, optically aligned, so that we, we have images that are in focus. Next slide. Optical alignment, 146 panels, each of them supported at five positions, and they deform gravitationally, so they, are, they, they do move. We have to sort out what's the optimum position over the course of a scan to keep these things supported with. They have adjustable, uh, uh, these, these five points uh, that where they're supported are adjustable, and uh, in order to adjust them to the right place, we need to measure how well it's aligned. So one of the, the, the only thing that we can do continuously is to monitor the image quality. So continuing monitoring of the image coming out, uh, either the, uh, the original time stream data as we survey, that would be the optimum the, right away and to be able to see if the image quality deteriorates. Or we can look at heavily produced, heavily reduced data and the actual images, but that's gonna be days or weeks later. The next technique that we, we use, if for example, there's a problem in the image quality that we're continually monitoring, is we can do radio holography. I'll show you a picture or a slide on that in just a moment. That is something we might maybe be able to do weekly, more likely it's monthly because it's a involved process. And then the really involved process is measuring the positions using a laser metrology system. So if we go to the next slide, I'll just, point out the tower holography. This is a, a, a classic approach where we put a 300 gigahertz radio source on a tower and we uh, are able to do holography on that, that radio holography. And uh, that gives us very, very detailed information on the imaging ability. You're me actually measuring this from an image, a hologram uh, at, uh, you're measuring various parts of the hologram. Uh, right where you'd also be normally having your camera. So that's really nice that measures a real image quality. Next slide, mirror alignment two, is a system where we have, this is really exotic. We have little robots climbing around on the mirror, placing 
retroreflectors, and then we have a near-infrared laser system with a number of these lasers uh, measuring the exact positions of the, laser, of, of the various mirror panels. And that's really involved and it's very, it takes quite a bit of time and we're hoping we don't have to do that more than once a year, but it's sort of the ultimate measure of, or, or sorry, the ultimate, well, this is the ultimate measure and then the ultimate adjustment of these uh, mirrors. Next slide. So I've given you a quick set of picture overview, but let me put this into words. The site is remote and hazardous. Because it's so high, we have to use oxygen full time. Everybody who's there is wearing an oxygen pack on their back and must use the oxygen full time. We know of one instance where someone did not use their oxygen full time, one of the people working on our road, and I'm afraid they died. We had, we had one fatality on the site already. Uh, we're really, really, really trying to work on, on safety issues all the time. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very hazardous site. We have no power at the site. We have to produce our own power, so we will have power generators. But it's such high altitude that we actually can't generate. We don't really want to generate power up at the telescope. For it, so we will, gen we will have a, a base site below the mountain, at the bottom of the mountain, where we have generators, and we will have to monitor those continuously to, and maintain those. We have snowfall where we lose access. It takes weeks to clear the snow up to the site. Um, so we will have no access to the telescope for weeks. That doesn't mean we can't continue to observe since we're observing, we plan to observe remotely. We don't plan to have many staff in Chile. We expect to have two technicians doing more or less daily visits to the site. But if we have anything, that, any major work's gonna require staff to fly in from North America or, or from Germany. Um, and uh, I, I should say that the minimal staff is only, you know, only allowed there during the daytime. And it's about six hours a day per person for the, these two people. So it's, it's really, that's, that's a big problem. We just do not have a lot of maintenance staff. We don't want things to break because it will take us weeks in between flying down there and bringing, bringing parts down from us wherever we are and, and doing the repairs. Uh, the other thing is, that, as I said, this is a unique telescope design. It's the first of its kind. We're driving it very hard. We don't really know what's going to break. Um, at the same time as it's moving very, very rapidly, it also has to be very precisely pointed on the sky all the time it's moving. We have to know exactly where it's pointing. And then to make things even worse, the routine work, that's routine uh, use of this observing is being done by scientists and that includes many graduate students. In fact, we're all thinking that we're going to have more than half the time we're going to have graduate students running this facility. They're not technical staff. It's not really possible to train them up. So that's uh, we need to have some way that does not involve the observers doing more than being aware that things could go wrong and watching for alerts that the system we're going to build uh, will will bring to their attention. So full time operations, 24 hours a day for many, many years and many monitoring functions. Are you on the problem too? I don't know if I remember to say next. Uh, we're on problem, oh yeah, now we're problem two. Okay, so I just said problem two, I forgot to say next at the end of problem one. Can you move on next to CCAT oper Prime operations team? So we have a huge staff right now. We have, we have dozens of people working on the project right now because we're under construction. But once we are built, we will only have a few staff, two in Chile, uh, we'll have uh, a few observatory staff, including engineers. We have a couple of administrators at Cornell. We have some IT staff here in Canada. Uh, the instruments on the telescope will be providing staff as well. There's two main instruments at the start, Prime Cam, which is a set of cameras, and Chai, which is a heterodyne spectrometer. And the people providing those, um, Canada's providing part of Prime Cam, actually the central most difficult part of it. Uh, so we will have some, we have, and the data reduction, all the data reduction from prime cams being done from Canadian staff. Um, and uh, we, we will have some engineers at Cornell, we'll have some engineers that are partners in Germany, um, but they're not in Chile. Next slide, solving the problem. So I'm, well, that's not bad. I, I've now shown you the problem. That, so 
It turns out a few months ago, we were thinking about this. We just started talking about operations. We have an operations committee that's had, I think, four meetings so far. And one of the people involved in this project in Germany had came to their attention that there was an opportunity to join a proposal in Germany to do exactly this thing of trying to predict maintenance requirements, trying to walk, trying to develop essentially machine learning software to look at the output of the various types of sensors we might have at the telescope. Germany has a number of telescopes that are funded in Germany, but are built in places like Africa, uh, South Africa especially, and, and in various parts of uh, South America and on some various islands in the Atlantic. And they had this problem about, uh, you know, how do you, what are we going to do about, about maintenance? And so a proposal was, was prepared about three or four months ago. And our, our people, the, our partners in Germany were aware of this and joined. Uh, and so CCAT Prime, our project is, is part of that proposal, but we're still just at the proposal stage. The proposal was submitted recently. Um, we have some rough ideas, but we're not experts in this area. We uh, are, are looking for ways to solve this. And one of the reasons it comes back to us in Canada is that the observatory control system is a Canadian-led responsibility. Staff working for me are in fact in charge of whatever it is we build in software to look at all these various forms of, of material coming out. Next slide. Um, Monitoring here, the facility. We are coming. We close have to huge time. numbers of sensors. We are coming close Sorry, to time. <laughs> I've got uh, three slides. Okay, great. I'm sorry, what? I said we're coming close to time, so if you have three slides, uh, that should be. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's it. So, so there's okay. many, many sensors. I've just listed uh, you know, kinds of sensors on the telescope, on things external to the telescope. We have cooling towers for providing cooling power glycol systems. We have the instruments. We have a weather station that's external to the telescope. We have um, measurements of electrical currents, temperature, pressure, vibration. Huge amounts of this housekeeping data that will be permanently archived. Next slide, monitoring facility two. So we need to maximize the uptime on this telescope. So we want to be able to find problems as they are happen. We want to generate alerts as things happen. But we also want to, since we have this data archived, we'd like to know, can we identify patterns or structures or things in the data streams that will tell us that there's potentially a component failure well before it happens by changes in those data streams. And we understand that, that such things are, have been standard in industry for a while. These problems exist for other telescopes too. We'd like to try and take advantage of that. And the next slide is my last slide. Um, the telescope design work is almost complete. There, there are uh, uh, many sensors that we're putting on there, but we don't know if there should be other things that we should sense for. Um, if, they, if there are, then we're right now at the time when we need to design in new sensors. The telescope's going to be assembled as a test assembly in Germany in late this year. And so we will get an opportunity to get baseline measurements, to actually measure these sensors in a very well controlled environment someplace at low altitude where we're not carrying oxygen, where we actually have enough brain power to think, because at high altitude, you just, you lose, you just become stupid. Uh, and I've worked a lot at high altitude, so I've experienced this many, many times. The final assembly is in, uh, it will be in Chile in late 2023. That's when we should finish our final uh, tests, uh, all, all of our acceptance tests. And we expect operations to start in early 2024. So the reason I, and I was really thrilled to see that have this opportunity to give this talk is that we are looking for ideas on how to make the best uses of all of this data that we're getting from all of these sensors. We'd like to be able to predict maintenance requirements. We'd like to be able to do preventative maintenance to, or know what parts are going wrong before they go wrong. And thank you for your attention. I think I've got a nice, ah, there's our logo in big. I'll go back to the future. So let's we'll leave it on the future. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, I, I apologize. Am I, is your first name pronounced Michel or Michelle or? Michelle. 
Michelle. Michelle. Okay, great. I got it right. So thank you so much. Uh, that was a fascinating talk. I consider myself a, a, a dilettante beginning, uh, like the backyard astronomer. So I would totally love a, a telescope like that. Um, so the, the machine learning is, you talked about the um, remote control of it and, and things like that. I'm interested, uh, and I know you probably didn't talk about it, but just what is the state of um, AI machine learning for image recognition? Uh, is that something that's in incorporated in your entire system as well? Well, that's that's up, uh, separate because that's in the okay. data reduction. That's in the software. Okay. That's what the the science teams will be doing. Uh, but what I did mention that that trying to look at image quality is something that could potentially be part of this preventative maintenance, because when things go wrong with the telescope, mm -hmm. what happens is, is the images deteriorate. So, for example, the time stream data if there's a very small point source unresolved by the telescope and you cross it, it should come up across as a very, it should, be, it should look like a point source. It should just, you, you're only getting a, a, a slice across it, but it should be, you should be able to see how narrow these features in the sky it should be very narrow. If they start to broaden, that means the telescope's going out of focus, for example. Uh, if it's not in the right, if you're not seeing it when you expect to see something that's a, you know there's a bright point source, if you don't see it, when you expect it to see it, to see it, that means the telescope's not pointed correctly. Right. Something and, went wrong. Or at so the right need to time, reposition, it right. scan at the right speed. So knowing where the bright point sources are in the sky and then looking at the time stream data uh, in a smart way, you can look for those kinds of things and, and what the quality of those, those, uh, those time stream scans are across those bright sources. Uh, oh, but on the other yeah. side, you know, the AI side of image actually looking at images that's uh, you know, astronomers have been doing that for, for decades. Right, right. It's not, it's not new at all. But uh, your technology is, and it's so exciting that we're part of the the first of its kind in the design. Um, and uh, and congratulations yeah, that, on that. that. The, the telescope company has got uh, requests for to build more, and every time they do, we get a hundred thousand dollar licensing fee. Well done. <laughs> I never made. Well I never had income. Astronomers don't normally have income from technology <laughs> developments. Well done, well done. Um, I invite anybody who has uh, questions from the audience, like uh, somehow either send it to us or if you're able to um, um, uh, contact Professor Feek directly. We are 20 minutes behind and um, we just want to get uh, caught up. Uh, the um, and uh, so we thank you very much, Professor Sheik. I would like to introduce our next speaker, and we do apologize for some of the technical problems that we had that caused our delay. Um, Professor Chin Chin Zhu from uh, the Department of Chemical Engineering. Um, Professor Zhu is an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo who has just recently joined. Um, she is also a faculty member at uh, Waterloo AI and also the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. Um, her uh, biography is available online. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Zhu with her topic, Dynamic Latent Variable Analytics for Inferential Sensor Modeling and Supervised Monitoring. Professor Zhu, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, everyone, to uh, join my uh, to listen to my presentation. So, uh, yeah, so I'm currently an assistant professor in the chemical engineering department, and uh, today I'm going to share one of our recent work, which is dynamic latent variable analytics uh, for modeling and monitoring. And uh, before I go into the detail of this topic, I'm going to briefly share the. Uh, main research focus in my group. So, uh, so the uh, my group mainly focus on the algorithm design and their usages on the like uh, process data analytics, uh, modeling and prediction for detection and diagnosis, as well as optimization. And for the algorithm design part, so we mainly uh, like design and uh, improve uh, like optimize algorithms uh, from these four series of machine learning algorithms, such as the multivariate statistical methods, uh, machine learning and deep learning, reinforcement learning, and optimization. So there are some uh, like emphasis for each groups of these uh, uh, these algorithms. For example, like from uh, multivariate statistical methods, uh, we are mainly dealing with the theoretical and practical issues raised from the uh, raised from uh, like process uh, systems engineering area, such as the dynamics, nonlinearity, etc. 
Okay, and currently we have established some uh, collaborations from uh, with uh, uh, some industrial pat uh, partners from these four, uh, mainly from these four areas. And uh, today's talk actually, actually mainly focus on the multivariate statistical methods and uh, mainly for the dynamic handling issue. Okay, so a brief introduction for the multivariate st uh, statistical process modeling and monitoring. So there are two steps for this topic. One is the uh, one. The first step is to uh, like use and design uh, the multivariate statistical methods so that we can extract independent and valuable information from the uh, correlated uh, data, uh, which, which are usually high dimensional. And there are some well-known methods to do this kind of task, such as the principal component analysis, PCA, uh, partial list squares, uh, CCA, LVR. And, uh, and we know like for principal component analysis, it is an um, uh, unsupervised method and it extracts the useful information by maximizing the variance of one uh, data set. For example, the process data, uh, which contains the like, for example, the flow rate, temperature, uh, the pressure of the process. And for the others, they are all supervised methods, mean that we have two data sets involved, such uh, like the process data X and the quality data Y. Okay. And uh, these methods, they based on the, they are based on different criteria to uh, extract the uh, independent information. For for example, PRS tries to maximize the covariance between uh, X and Y. CCA tries to maximize their uh, correlation, and LVR tries to maximize the projection of the uh, Y on the X space so that we can improve its prediction power. OK, and uh, after the decomposition of these methods, we can decompose the original data set into uh, like the principal component subspace and the uh, residual subspace. So the principal uh, component subspace, it contains the uh, most information of the original data. And while we can say the re residual subspace only contain the noise. And then the next step is that we can develop the corresponding monitoring statistics to monitor the variations inside of those two uh, subspaces based on their uh, data distribution. Uh, for example, like uh, we have T squared to monitor the principal component subspace, and we have SPE to uh, to monitor the uh, like the uh, residual subspace. And also we develop their con uh, control limits according to their data uh, data distribution. OK, so here as an example, so for each data uh, that we collect after we have the model chain, for each test uh, sample that we have, we calculate their T square MQ monitoring indices. And then uh, if this, uh, if they, uh, it's, called, uh, it's monitoring index is uh, like within the control limit, then we regard th this sample as normal. Otherwise, uh, it is regarded as an uh, abnormal sample. And then uh, we need to take further actions such as the like, uh, like for diagnosis to locate its root causes. OK, and uh, currently, actually, for all these samples, they, uh, we have an implicit assumption. They assume that actually the data or the process that we are dealing with is static, so there's no dynamics involved. But actually, in reality or in practi uh, practical industrial processes, this is not the case. We will always have some uh, like dynamics, in, uh, be, like either between the variables or like involved, like coming from the uh, disturbance, the ambient environment. And uh, in the literature, there are a lot of like dynamic algorithms uh, proposed. Uh, there are several ideas. So the I, one idea is very straightforward. We just augment the all the like data, input da uh, process data and quality data, and then feed the whole uh, like data set into the algorithm to uh, let the algorithm learn the dynamics itself. So this matter is very brute force, it is very simple, but the drawback is that also that it's not very uh, like efficient and also the learned uh, like relation is kind of like hard to interpret. And, uh, and but this kind of matter actually is also very widely used nowadays because of its simple, uh, uh, simplicity. And another idea is to like we just ignore or we just remove the dynamics from the data and uh, like uh, like like put the input the other things into the model. So for this kind of model, actually, it kind of like ignore the dynamics in the uh, in the system. So uh, it's, their performance uh, for sure is not optimal. And recently, actually, there is uh, one series of dynamic inner PLS or CCA uh, proposed. And the idea of this kind of algorithm is that they assume uh, 
uh, uh, uh, they assume that the current uh, like quality score of output score is a weighted uh, linear uh, combination of past and current process scores. So this is the uh, relation that they assumed in their inner model. And to be consistent with this relation, they also assume that uh, they also uh, like try to maximize the uh, like the covariance between the output score and the weighted combination of the input score. So this algorithm, this uh, dynamic model achieved a very good performance in some practical industrial processes. But there are still several issues involved in this kind of algorithms uh, and also other dynamic algorithms in that uh, we know like in practical industrial processes, like for the quality data, they are hard to measure or usually they come with a delay because we need to like, for example, uh, the quality data contain, uh, contains of like uh, the composition. Uh, of the uh, of the product stream, so we need a specific measurement, um, a specific facility to measure it. So it comes with a delay, and also uh, it uh, uh, the uh, and also it is sometimes hard to measure. But once we have this data, this credit data available, if we can uh, like exploit its emission into our model, then this kind of model actually can achieve improved performance and also um, uh, can uh, and, and also uh, they can provide more insights into our following modeling, monitoring and diagnosis work. OK, so motivated by this idea, uh, we proposed a series of new algorithms. We call them as dynamic autoregressive latent variable analytics methods. For example, like dynamic autoregressive PLS. And uh, the idea of this uh, actually is very, also very straightforward. So in addition to the dynamics involved in the quality data and also the process data, we also trying to exploit the information uh, contained in the quality data as well as the past uh, quality data. And to be consistent with this uh, inner model design, we design our uh, object, uh, the optimization ob objective of the out model as follows. So this part is related to the uh, like maximizing the covariance uh, between the quality data and the past uh, process data. And this part is regarding to the past quality data. And uh, then we can use the use some mathematical uh, tools to solve these kinds of problems. And uh, so this is the general procedure for this series of methods. First, we collect the historical data like process data and uh, like quality data. Then we uh, rearrange them into the ZX and ZY uh, like uh, augmented matrix. And then uh, we also have the uh, current quality variable available. Then uh, based on this, we are trying to maximize their covariance so that we can extract the uh, model parameters for the out uh, model, which are uh, these uh, score parameters and uh, the quality, uh, the current quality score. And then uh, in the inner model, we are trying to build an autoregressive model to, uh, so this is the like the relation that we assumed. So this part is the auto modeling and this part is the inner modeling. And afterwards, we are trying because this uh, after this kind of step, we only extract one, uh, one set of latent variables and we need to extract uh, like more variables, so uh, more variables so that we can uh, like explain the variations inside of the X and Y very well. So we need to remove the uh, effect of the extracted data from the original uh, data set. And then uh, we call this step as the deflation. So after that, we can uh, like uh, continue to exceed uh, to, to extract uh, like other our next set of latent variables. OK, so this is for the modeling and based on this. So after the modeling of DAPRS, we can decompose the original data X and Y into uh, two data uh, into two subspaces. So the principal component subspace contains the uh, dynamic relation between X and Y and the remaining actually is very hard to interpret. So uh, in order to make it uh, uh, like easy to interpret, we propose the concurrent technique to decompose the, uh, the X and the Y further with the uh, PCA or the PCA uh, techniques. So after the, the, uh, the decomposition, we can decompose the quality data into these four subspaces. So this part is mainly contains the variations related. Uh, so they are relevant to our quality data and also they, are, uh, they can be predicted from our process data. OK, and for this one, uh, so for this part, it is dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic, but it has nothing to do with our process data. And uh, this part actually is static, uh, static only. 
Okay, and similarly for the X space. So this part is dynamic and this part is dynamic principle and this part is dynamic uh, noise. And we also derive their corresponding monitoring indices to monitor, monitor the variations inside of these subspaces. Okay, so uh, these are the general idea of these kind of uh, methods. Um, uh, it's kind of, there are a lot of mathematics involved, but next, let me show you one uh, in the, uh, industrial case study to, uh, like to show the power of these kind of methods. So uh, this method is, uh, sorry, this uh, this case study is from the uh, like uh, real world industrial process and is for the food uh, manufacturing. So we are trying to like make uh, uh, French fries from this uh, process. And also uh, there are some there are some constraints imposed by the like food agency, so they require the center of the of this vessel should be higher than a threshold. Okay, and uh, so the current uh, and uh, the way that they uh, they use to measure the center of the uh, of this uh, vessel is that they uh, they need to open uh, one bag of the potato and then insert a th uh, thermal couple into the bag and then to measure the temperature. But the bad thing, is, so this is very accurate. But the bad thing is that once we open that bag, actually the whole bag should be thrown away because it may, may be faced with some potential pollution. So it is not economic. Uh, economical for the uh, like from the uh, company or from the com uh, com uh, company perspective and they want to develop some models to uh, like replace uh, to replace this kind of measurement method and uh, currently uh, before they reach out to me uh, the way that they uh, they build up this model is based on some principle uh, first principle uh, methods and these are the data that they provided to us and the dotted line actually uh, they are the uh, actual uh, like experimental uh, experimental uh, experimental data that they collected from the process and the red and blue sol uh, solid line they are the uh, like predictive values from the models and as we can see that for those models they match well for this part but uh, like for the beginning and also the ending part actually uh, their performance uh, performance is not very good right so after they reach out to us, we are trying to uh, like build a model from the data perspective. And we use 18 process variables, which are related to the flow rates, temperatures, pressure, etc. And the quality data uh, variable for sure is the uh, te standard temperature inside of this vessel. And uh, here I show several uh, the, uh, the the prediction uh, results from uh, for four uh, for algorithms which are DIPRS, uh, so LSTM is a neural network model, uh, DAPRS and also DACCA. So to look at this variable, uh, this data uh, better, I zoom in this part a little bit. So as you can see, this, uh, the so the black line is the experimental data and this line is from the neural network model and as you can see actually it's, uh, it's, it is the uh, worst among these four algorithms right and also compared to DIPLS uh, like for our algorithm DAPLS and D DACCA they achieve better prediction and modeling performance okay so one step further uh, uh, so we also examine the dynamics involved in the quality residual after we perform that PLS and DACCA. As we can see that after, expo uh, after performing DAPLS in the uh, in the data set, uh, only few dynamics are left in the quality residual subspace, which is expected, or w which is what we want. But this is not the case for that PLS. Okay, and um, also we are trying to like perform, uh, trying to perform the uh, monitoring uh, work for their uh, like 40 data set and this is one of the results. So this figure here shows the actual cases for the uh, actual scenarios for the uh, quality data as well as the for the process data. So as we can see, this part actually is introduced at around uh, 2800 sample for the process data set. So that means the process data actually is affected by this uh, this part uh, at, uh, from this point. But the quality data set actually is not affected until around like 3500. So this is, uh, reflect the actual variations of the data. And as you can see from the result of DIPRS, so uh, for the creative related uh, dynamics here, actually it uh, fails to detect the, uh, the fault, uh, but it detects the, uh, like the fault in the process side. 
Okay, so this is actually uh, is not uh, satisfactory, right? And look at the results, monitoring results from our proposed algorithm. So TC square here, this is the part, or this is the variations that's related to the quality data, uh, but it is also uh, predictive from our process uh, side. As you can see that uh, this uh, index actually detect the fault at around like 3100, uh, and it is actually uh, predict the occurrence of the uh, effect, effect of this fault on the quality data set. Okay, and for the process side, actually it is uh, like as expected than the actual variations. Okay, so due to time uh, limitation, I will not share more cases for this uh, for this case study. And uh, I just uh, I want to draw yeah. So just one last slide. Okay. Yeah, one last time here. So this kind of algorithm actually can be uh, the idea actually can be extended to other uh, other matters as well, such as the dynamic autoregressive CCA and LVR, but they can be used for different uh, purposes. For example, CCA actually is very good at prediction, so it uh, the VA CCA can be used to impute the missing data, and LVR is more uh, powerful for the monitoring side, so uh, it can achieve like the best monitoring results compared uh, over others and um, also uh, like this kind of uh, matters it uh, fully exploit the dynamics inside either in the process that uh, process side and the quality data side and um, also uh, we perform uh, the further decomposition on the uh, like extracted subspaces so that we can realize a comprehensive modeling and monitoring purpose for the uh, process and uh, quality data uh, side okay uh, yeah that's it for my uh, for my uh, talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Zhu. Um, that was very humbling, especially for somebody from like me that with doesn't have very strong math or computer science background. That um, th that was very information packed, and uh, again, a little bit a little bit humbling. It's like, geez, did I study it all? <laughs> but anyways, um, I think a lot of our audience is actually very interested in the applications of uh, this this work that you're doing. And um, you had mentioned uh, the the <clears throat> the industrial application with respect to produce and things like that. I was just wondering, and I apologize if I missed it. Have you mentioned who your partners are in this? Like, do you have industrial partners, or you and uh, who uh, else are you working with? Yes, uh, so for the uh, case study that I'm sharing here, so this is uh, an American company like uh, Father Farms. They are uh, like uh, they are they are produce the uh, French fries. Uh, well, can you say that again? I can. Uh, farms? Fa Father Farms. Fa Father. Uh, yeah, Father Farms. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. And um, uh, how long have you been partnering with them? And what else? Is it mostly the potatoes or can this uh, be applied to other type of uh, produce or food things or, or other manufactured goods? <laughs> uh, yeah, so actually currently uh, this kind of matters actually can be uh, can be applied for any processes like any uh, process that they have. But currently um, uh, we only focus on the data that they uh, th that they provide uh, to, they provide to us, which is for the fry fries. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. I understand. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. Actually, the same techniques that we have applied for the like waste water treatment as well. Mm. So with um, also waste treatment process, so like waste water and waste. Oh, fabulous. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Uh, once again, I invite all of the um, audience members. Uh, let us know um, if you have further questions after the uh, the workshop is completed and we'll be able to forward to our professors. And uh, just we are again 20 minutes behind and we again, we apologize for the uh, technical problems that have caused this. We will still be um, after the lunch break, we'll still be um, starting at the same time at one o'clock. Professor Zhu, thank you so much for this yeah. uh, and, and congratulations on your this this fantastic work. Um, next on our list is Professor Laurent Simon from the University of Bordeaux. Professor, uh, thank you very much, Professor Simon. I understand that a uh, biography was uh, read for you yesterday, so I'll invite my our, our audience to read that um, just very shortly. Uh, professor Simon is a professor of computer science in, at the Engineering School of Bordeaux, INP and LABRI. Um, we welcome him for his talk on AI for Critical Systems, Progresses and Limits. Please. Vous avez la parole. Did I say that right? 
I was saying we, on, on peut le faire en français if you speak French. No? <laughs> Un petit peu, j'oublie beaucoup. <laughs> Just for you. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. So, do, do you see my slides? Yes? Yes, we, uh, AI okay. for critical systems, okay. progress That's and perfect. limits. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, uh, I think one, one of the reasons for this workshop is probably the incredible progress observed in AI, and especially uh, as we have seen in the in, in the also previous talk in machine learning. However, I mean, if uh, precision was the main leading force for machine learning papers, I mean, especially if you wanted your paper to be to be accepted. Uh, the picture is not so clear. Uh, as soon as at the end you want your AI application to be used on some critical system, or if you want to have some insurance of the quality of the decision on a particular case. And uh, the goal of my talk is to very quickly present uh, a classical and efficient approach uh, to ensure that your AI system is doing what, what you want or what you have designed, uh, what, what you had in mind when designing it. So first of all, uh, I want to precise the kind of problem and the kind of, of, um, of uh, property we want to prove on which kind of, of problem or AI system. So it is uh, in AI uh, commonly admitted that we can split the kind of AI system we are working on uh, depending on the quality of the thinking. Uh, I mean, if you, if as a human, you can you can solve a problem uh, very quickly, like perception, or if you want to have, a, if you have an intuition solution, you you find correlation of something that you are seeing, or you walk or run, you don't think at all uh, when when you are doing that. Then maybe you uh, maybe you are addressing a problem. Uh, in the in the family of system one system, so it's thinking fast. Uh, as the opposite, when you perform a reasoning with some kind of uh, introspection on the quality of the reasoning, when you understand what you are doing and why it's correct, uh, then in fact you are in the system too. So there are these two approach: thinking fast and, think and thinking slow. And uh, in practice, the set of uh, systems. Uh, that are addressed by system one, the set of AI systems that are designed for system one are classically uh, machine learning approaches. Uh, for system two, it's not it's not at all the same the same case. You have you have to use some kind of combinatorial approach uh, that can manipulate symbols, which is called symbolic AI, and uh, and you have to define a formal language of reasoning. Uh, usually, for this kind of uh, of uh, of problems, a decision can require hours of, com of computations or weeks of computation. But at the end, you have uh, results and you are 100% sure of your results. So intuitively, the idea is, is um, I mean, if, if you have no intuition of uh, if, if your system, if your problem is system one or system two, you can ask yourself if you can find an algorithm to solve it. I mean, if you have a, an introspection sense of how to solve this, this problem, then maybe it's a system two. If it's just something that you cannot explain, like the way you are working, uh, it's probably system one. But uh, the problem with system two problem uh, approach is that very quickly, this combinatorial problem that you are designing, are. Uh, are uh, exploding. Uh, I mean, the number of possibilities to, to check are quickly, uh, completely crazy. I mean, you you can, you you may have to check more solution than there are in the particular in the in, in the universe. So, traditionally, when uh, uh, I mean, how how can we design combinatorial uh, procedure to solve this kind of reasoning problem? And um, what is very surprising, in fact, that in practice, we are using uh, a reasoning mechanism that is very simple. Here, simple is beautiful. I mean, you just uh, use what is called propositional logic to represent your knowledge. Uh, so the facts, they are either true or false in your knowledge, and you are encoding them by variables with these symbols. And now you have a way of, of representing your knowledge, but how you do reasoning? And reasoning is just some kind of calculus over the propositional logic. And the, the, the rule, I will come back later on this rule, 
after, uh, is it's very simple. I mean, if you just know that the fact A implies the fact B, and you know that the fact B implies the fact C, then you will just allow yourself to deduce that A implies C. And it's it's very classical logic, and it was formalized by Aristotle uh, more than 2,000 years ago. And in, in a propositional logic, we use this kind of uh, logical connector, but it's, it's, the same, uh, it's the same idea, obviously. So, uh, more precisely, uh, you, we are dealing with variables, as, as I said, with literals, which can be a variable or the negation of, of literal, and we will manipulate what we call clause, which is a disjunction of literals. And the formula, which will uh, represent the knowledge, or maybe the property you want to check, uh, uh, as we will see uh, after that, it can be an automaton that you want to check. It is written in conjunctive normal form, so it's a set of clauses. Here we have a set of four clauses, one clause of length three, clause of length one, two, and two. And the problem that we are dealing with is a big question in computer science and uh, theoretical com uh, com computers. So is, is there is an assignment of the variable x1, x2, x3, so that when you assign them to true or false in this formula, you make the evaluation of the formula true. So this is a big question. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's probably one of the most important problems in computer science today. And that there are many other questions that you ask that you can ask yourself on the, on the, uh, on the formula on which you are working. You can ask if there is a solution, okay, but also you, you can check if the theory is contradictory, so you can try to prove if there is no solution. And here there is a, uh, a very big uh, difference between the two questions. That if there is an assignment, then you can just um, uh, show the assignment. It will be a proof. I mean, you just have to say, okay, this variable must be true, this variable must be true, false, and so on and so on. If the theory is contradictory, then uh, how can you give a proof and how long the proof must be? Uh, so this is a, a, a big problem uh, in, in, in computer science and in practice also, as we will see that the proof can be exponentially uh, long if there, is no, if there is a contradiction. So let me just illustrate this with two examples. The first example is, a historic, is an historical example in SAT, is called bounded model checking. You want to um, check that some kind of automaton is, uh, never, will never reach a bad state. Here you start, for example, in this automaton at the green state, and then you can move from state to state, and you want to, to check if the red uh, state will be reachable at some point. Here, we can see it's very easy. We, there is a path here, a path here. But what if you search loop with just search uh, algorithm with just loop forever in this, in this state? So uh, this is the, the, the first problem. The second problem is that in practice, we will uh, use uh, automatons that encode the, the transition of like uh, CPUs or much more higher combinatorial problem. So here, let's take an example of how we can use proposition logic to check this, uh, this kind of problem of reachability. The first uh, step is to uh, translate the problem of reachability of an automaton into a SAT formula. And this is what I will explain here. Here, I just take a very simple uh, circuit, which take two bits, A and B, and add one to the value of these two bits. So for instance, A, A is here the lower bit. So if I, if I put zero, zero here, plus one will, be, will give me one zero. If I give uh, zero, one, it will give me one, one, okay? So here, I give the, translation, the, the, the transition of the automata. That, that I've got here. And the point here is that as soon as I have an automaton that takes as input uh, propositional variables and gives output a propositional variable, I can, I can express it as a logical formula. Here, this transition function uh, that, is, uh, that encodes these uh, chains here is exactly this formula. So the value of this A prime is the negation of this one. And the value of B prime is XOR of these two bits here. So how, how can we do uh, check something uh, with that? So uh, 
let's say that we we have this example, this formula, transition function, and the property, uh, very simple here, is is a state one one reachable. Of course, we know that it's reachable, but it's a toy example. So uh, let's say is it reachable starting from time step zero? Okay, so for this we will bound, we will take a bound k, and we will increment this bound uh, 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 as as we may want. Okay, so here I take my formula and I just instantiate my variables. I will unroll the loop of my automaton, and I say, okay, my initial state is zero, is uh, a is zero and b is zero. I have not a zero and not b at time zero. And I just take my, my transition function that I just defined before and then instantiate it to mimic the fact that I, I, I take state at time zero and I produce a state at time, at time one with these variables. So here I just add a number of, of constraints and at the end, if I put everything together, here is just the fact that I check that the property is true after two time step, after zero time step, after one time step. At the end, if I take the conjunction of everybody here, the question of uh, reachability of my automaton is just the fact that is this formula satisfiable at the end? So here I have, uh, I just wanted to illustrate uh, some, some uh, um, uh, some procedure to check the reachability of automaton. And why are we using SAT uh, solvers here and not uh, other combinatorial problem to check the reachability, just check in the automaton, unroll the automaton and so on. In fact, the progress in SAT solving has been really impressive in the last 20 years and it's still progressing every year. So despite uh, these strong theoretical li limits, industrial sized examples are daily solved with uh, millions of variables. And um, in practice, SAT server are one uh, very interesting candidate to, to build what we could call artificial trust, which is trusting in artificial intelligence. Okay, so more precisely, the, the rules that I will use, it, it has some interest after that, uh, is it's called the resolution rule. So I take these guys here, which are called clauses, which are the junction of literals. So if I have two clauses here that clash on a, on a literal X and not X here, I can add a new clause, which is this one here, which is uh, just a concatenation of the literals of the two clauses here, which is, in fact, if you uh, rewrite it uh, in logic, uh, you can see that it's exactly the transitivity of the modus ponens here. It's exactly the rules that say that if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C, which is what I, I, I introduced uh, a little bit before. So the, the, the key point of that server is that in fact, in practice, they are just using this rule. Okay, and uh, but the secret of that server is that they, they are doing this very, very quickly and they have some kind of uh, very tricky heuristics to do that efficiently. So, and the advantage here of having just one simple rule is that at the end of your computation, you can just print somehow the, the set of resolutions that you have done and you can ask another program another solver, another checker, to check that your proof is correct indeed. And this was applied uh, in, uh, in a few years ago on a, on a mathematical problem, which was, which is called the boolean Pythagorean uh, triples problem. And you are asking yourself, is it possible to colorize uh, the integers uh, from one to n, so that no triplets, no Pythagor Pythagorean triplets are monochromatic, uh, Pythagorean triplets are defined like that. And here I represent uh, the solution for n equals this number. And in fact, it was not possible to find such, uh, uh, to ensure this for n equal to this number. And if you just count the number of possible candidates for this problem, you see that the number of candidates is really completely crazy. Uh, and it was solved using a SAT solver uh, on 800 CPUs. The SAT translation was easy, but what was hard it was to, to split the problem. Okay, so we can prove, we can use this kind of very simple language to prove very complicated problems here, in, uh, in fact. 
So, of course, in mathematics, the challenge is not to build the bigger proof uh, uh, that, that you can, but the point here is that this is the smallest proof that we have. And maybe for people that are interested in explainable AI, uh, a key point here is to be able, I mean, we don't know to, uh, how to do that, but uh, would be to, to explain the proof in human's words and not uh, forcing a human to read 200 terabytes of, of outputs. So, uh, here, I, I just want to point out um, some kind of illusion if you are not from AI. I mean, people from outside think that uh, because you have built your own uh, system, uh, you can predict or you can understand what your system will do. But in fact, for system one and system two, you have a, a very complicated combinatorial problem because you may have billions of parameters. And for system two, there are billions of parameters for machine learning systems. And for system two, uh, you will uh, base your decision on uh, millions of computation that no humans can check. So you just have to use your authority arguments for trust. So the point here is that um, oh, it's okay. I mean, maybe uh, we are building tools where explainability is not possible. We just have to use them uh, as tools. I mean, they are very good to prove stuff that we cannot prove and it's okay, we are okay with that. So the challenge for self based proof system um, is to be able to prove machine learning uh, black boxes. And, uh, but there are many problems for that. We need a formal language to express property to prove. So for instance, if someone from uh, uh, machine learning say, okay, how can you prove with a sat that a cat is a cat and a picture? I don't know, I don't know how, how, to, how to formalize the fact that a cat is a cat, uh, at least with neural networks as, as they are doing, as they are built now. And uh, also there are some problems where, uh, in fact, just a, a yes, no answer is not sufficient. You need to count the solutions to estimate the number of possible solutions given something. Uh, and this is even harder than just that. Uh, there have been some uh, attempts to binarize neural networks. So instead of having floats or um, having very complicated uh, um, nonlinear function, you just use OR and XOR uh, and uh, negation uh, on neural networks. But uh, it's, it's still difficult to prove and they are not as efficient as, uh, as neural networks. I mean, you need to add many more neurons in this kind of setup. Uh, it seems that SMT-based approach seems to be more ap appropriate. But at the end, what I want to, to express here in this talk is that maybe we are asking the, the wrong question. I mean, maybe it's not uh, useful to try to prove unprovable black box system. We are targeting precision, but at the end, if you want to have trust, maybe you should come back uh, from zero and build a provable system from scratch. I mean, if proof is a priority, you need to accept to lose uh, something on precision. So just to finish, uh, at, the, at the lab, at the library, we are developing a SAT server, which is called Glucose, with a, with a friend of mine in the north of France. And uh, our, our main question is to uh, massively parallelize it, I mean, like uh, to use uh, many cores uh, on some problem. And also, which is linked to the fact that uh, I said that uh, we are building tools that we don't understand, we are still experimentally uh, studying our solver, like uh, when to restart, which clothes to learn. I mean, I, I didn't have, have time to describe the, 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 the internal components of the solver, but uh, there are many components that we don't clearly understand. And also, we are using, uh, we are using uh, machine learning stuff uh, to understand and to learn important components of that solver. And uh, that's it. I try to, to do a quick overview of what we are doing and what I think is important for uh, proof, uh, pr proving a black box AI system. Thank you for this. Um... Uh, this talk and just very quickly, uh, uh, just two questions. And I apologize that I didn't get to see much of your uh, talk yesterday uh, about uh, AI and University of Bordeaux. Can you uh, mention a little bit about a little bit more about the facilities and especially L is it Labri or L-A-B-R-I? I'm not sure how you pronounce well, that. Um, 
Yeah, l'abri, l'abri is good. L'abri, la, <laughs> comme le fromage, oui. Non, it's not le bris. Okay, it's, oh, okay. <laughs> it's less smelly. <laughs> okay. I, I, I like bris. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, no, um, there, there are some um, uh, different facilities. L'abri is the main uh, computer science laboratory. But we, we also have um, an INRIA center just uh, a few meters uh, near the library. INRIA is a national research institute in computer science in France, so they have many buildings in France at some point. And uh, we also have very nearby mathematics uh, center, research center in mathematics and in materials. So um, there are many people working on this, on this, uh, on, on the kind of topics that I, I, I heard today. Uh, in materials, but uh, in library we we mainly have um, uh, an approach on AI that is close to formal method. I mean, we are, we we have people working on image on a rec image recognition on uh, deep learning and so on. But um, one of the of the of the strongest uh, approach in in library is more like to try to add trust and uh, to AI systems and to build a robust AI system. Yeah. Okay. So we have a new project uh, that is starting in a few weeks uh, called uh, Robustness in uh, Automated Decision Systems that gather together a lot of people from, uh, from different sites uh, in Bordeaux. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, and again, um, we cannot wait to be able to visit you and have you come yeah, visit welcome. us. And uh, <laughs> yes. I don't want to comment on my fondness for French wine. That, uh, <laughs> but uh, you can ask Vijay. I think he, he went to Bordeaux like uh, five years ago. I, I organized a SAT conference, and uh, there was a, each day there was a different wine for the conference with uh, with description. And it's like, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And uh, but anyways, well, I'm keeping our audience from lunch and uh, our friends from France and the Netherlands. I think it's dinner time for you. <laughs> so yeah. for our afternoon session, I would like to introduce Professor Vijay, Vijay Ganesh, who is an associate professor at the University of Waterloo and is the co-director of the Waterloo Artificial Intelligence Institute. And he is also a professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering. Is this correct? Right. So uh, I would like to welcome Professor Ganesh for his talk, Logic Guided Machine Learning. Take it away, yeah. Vijay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your very kind introduction and thank you for all of you uh, for attending my talk. So today I will talk about a new approach to automated scientific discovery, uh, which I have termed as Logic Guided Machine Learning and Logic Guided Genetic Algorithms. And this is joint work with my students Dhananjay Ashok, uh, Joseph Scott, Mason Panju, and a postdoc from Perimeter of Sebastian Wetzel. Next slide, please. So what is automated scientific discovery? Allow me to present some context and motivation here. Next slide. Um, so recently there was a paper in Nature actually last year which talks about the Nobel Turing challenge, which is creating the engine for scientific discovery. So the question there is, can we leverage AI technology somehow to be able to automatically discover laws of nature, uh, whether it be physics, chemistry, biology, what have you, uh, such that the resultant law is consistent with known facts, but also, um, uh, is presented in a symbolic form. So typically, you know, physical laws are presented in mathematical symbolic form, and that's an important aspect of this challenge. Now, uh, while there have been some technologies that I will discuss right now that have uh, that, that are aimed at this problem, we are nowhere close to uh, being able to, um, you know, claim that we, we have accomplished what is set out in this particular challenge. We are very far away from it, but the point of this talk is twofold. One is to kind of present some ideas that could lead, could be starting points that could lead to solving this problem, but also kind of open up the discussion about what automated scientific discovery is and why is it such an interesting field and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So in a nutshell, automated scientific discovery 
the goal there is you're given data, you're given a mathematical language in which to represent an equation, and the output of your system has to be an equation that fits the data. And ideally that not only fits the data, but it's consistent with the domain knowledge that we have about that field. So for example, in physics, you know, if you are going to present something in the context of thermodynamics, and if you have some equation that describes the uh, working of a dynamical system, uh, and further, if your equation happens to somehow violate the second law of thermodynamics, I don't have to even listen to you at that point. I can just reject outright what you're claiming, right? Because one of the key principles in thermodynamics is that whatever you say has to be consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. OK, so now there are many commercial tools out there that actually claim to do this. And this whole field has a term, has a name called symbolic regression. So this is different from machine learning because machine learning also claims to learn a function over input data. But here there is an additional piece, which is not only that you have to learn this function over the given data, and not only it has to generalize in some sense, but that the output has to be represented in a mathematical form. And the commercial tools that are available include Eureka and Turing Bot that have been around for a decade or so and are actually being used in all kind of uh, settings to learn uh, uh, equations over uh, complex data. Okay, next slide, please. So, but there is a problem with a lot of these current symbolic regression tools. Um, a classic problem is overfitting and it's even, which is generally plagues machine learning, but it particularly plagues uh, this field. And uh, these, they uh, overfit the data and have poor generalizability. And part of the reason as to why they have poor generalizability and which is where my thought about logic gated machine learning started was that there is no guidance in terms of what else they should be consistent with. So yes, you can output an equation that fits the data. Maybe it generalizes in some way, but there is no guidance as to why uh, it should make sense. And this question was the root of my work that I will uh, show in a few minutes. Further, uh, these systems suffer from poor data efficiency. You need a lot of data before you are able to learn quote unquote the correct equation. And, and the third point that I already mentioned, which is typically these, at least for these commercial tools, there is no easy way to incorporate domain knowledge. Next slide, please. So here is my key insight is automated scientific discovery can be boiled down to machine learning plus logic. Now, as you all well know, uh, there are two broad areas in AI that have been the pillars of AI from the very beginning. One is machine learning, the other is logic. Today, of course, when we say AI, we don't talk about logic as much, but 10 years ago, we didn't talk, or 15 years ago, we didn't talk as much about machine learning. So these things come in waves. But the point is that these two are the key pillars. And further, these two pillars of AI have not been talking too much to each other over the past many decades. There has been some interaction, but not too much. And one of the goals of my research going forward is to combine machine learning and logic in different ways to solve a variety of different problem problems. And one such problem that I'm focused on is automated scientific discovery. So I'm claiming that logic explicit representation of knowledge in terms of mathematical formulas and reasoning about them using proof systems is a powerful way to do automated scientific discovery. Next slide, please. So here is the basic principle behind logic guided machine learning. And if you understand this particular slide, I think the rest of the talk is pretty much like details. Uh, so. In our system, what we have is we have a learning phase, a symbolic regression tool, and this could be a neural network or some other method to, uh, or genetic algorithm for that matter, uh, that takes us input data and outputs a learned model, but crucially, it outputs it in, in the form of a mathematical formula. And this mathematical formula is then fed as input 
to a logic phase, which is a either a Boolean SAT solver or an SMT solver. I will define these terms in a minute. Uh, and then what the SAT and SMT solvers do is they take as input your learnt model, but additionally, they take as input auxiliary truths. These are domain knowledge that you as a human have collected over a period of time and you know to be true of that particular domain. And then you feed that and you ask the solver, hey, is the learnt model consistent with the auxiliary truth? If it is not consistent, we got a problem. We construct a counter example. If the solver says, nope, these two are not consistent, then the solver constructs a counter example. The counter example is such that it satisfies the model but violates the auxiliary truth. This counter example is then, you know, we have to get the appropriate label for it. So we get the appropriate label for it and we feed it back to the learning phase. And in this manner, we are in, in some sense doing active learning. We actively adding new data points to the learner so that it can do a better job at learning the uh, uh, learning the, the equation that you wanted to. And if, no, can you just stay here? And if there is no uh, inconsistency between the learnt model and the auxiliary truth, then a certificate of correctness would be produced by this SAT or SMT solver. And that would tell you that this is go as good as it gets with respect to your current knowledge. And so therefore you can take it to the bank. Uh, so that's the core principle. So there is a corrective feedback loop between the machine learning phase and the deduction, the logical, the mathematical phase, where the mathematical phase takes us input auxiliary knowledge you know about the domain represented in mathematic, as mathematical for, represented as mathematical formulas and is used to actively help the machine learning model learn in a better way so that it doesn't overfit and it learns the correct uh, equation. Next slide, please. So, uh, so just to make the problem statement a bit more precise, the input is a label data set composed of label points representing some function, which you don't know, but that your goal is to learn that function. Uh, and of course, yeah, I want to present it in terms of a logical equation, uh, ideally the smallest such logical equation over some language L uh, in which the auxiliary truths are also written. And you're given a set of auxiliary truths, which you know to be true of that domain knowledge. The output is a learnt model and ideally a certificate of correctness, which says that the model entails all of these formulas in the domain knowledge of the auxiliary truths, then none of them are violated. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the input to the learning phase is this label data and the output is a symbolic representation. And you can use a variety of different techniques uh, to do this. You can use a symbolic regression method or uh, a genetic algorithm based symbolic regression method or a DNN based symbolic regression method. But I'll talk about it more in a, in a, in a minute. Next slide. And in the logic phase, the input to the logic phase the solver is a symbolic representation and the output is either a proof of correctness with a tight error bound or a counterexample that tells you how and why your symbolic representation of the input data violated the domain knowledge. Next slide, please. And um, we also allow for, um, it, we don't necessarily say that the it has to uh, satisfy the auxiliary truth 100%, we allow for error terms. So in this way, you can, um, in the context of physics and, and other domains, uh, this gives us more room, uh, more uh, ability to uh, learn the right equations as opposed to more discrete spaces where um, where you have to kind of, where you have to, you, you either satisfy the, the, you, uh, the formal, the domain knowledge or you don't. Next slide. So I'm going to skip this slide because it kind of gets into the weeds of how we do this. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please, and kind of keep the focus on the big picture and the big idea here. Um, can you go to the next slide? So I want to take a couple of minutes to introduce this idea called a solver. What is meant by a solver, which is actually my, my area of research. And I focus on these software tools called 
Boolean SAT solvers and SNT solvers. And the, uh, as some of you are well aware, uh, the Boolean satisfiability problem um, stated as follows uh, is that you are you have as input formulas over Boolean logic in conjunctive normal form. We say a formalizing conjunctive normal form if it is a conjunction of disjunction of literals where the literals are either Boolean variables or their negation. And the question being posed is, can you find a satisfying assignment to this formula if one exists or prove that it does not have any satisfying assignment? Now, this is the classic problem uh, which, which has been around with us for a very long time. But in 1971, Stephen Cook showed that the Boolean satisfiability problem is in fact NP complete. And our belief is that uh, this problem is not tractable in general. Uh, this is the famous P versus NP question. And the common belief among computer scientists is that P is not equal to NP. There is a similar class of problems for first order theories. First order theories are theories over that, that go beyond Boolean logic or propositional logic. And in first order theories, you have quantifiers, your variables can range over uh, domains such as natural numbers or the real numbers or geometric objects. Pretty much most of mathematics today is written in first order logic and set theory. And you also have higher order logics. And the kind of the goal of this field of solver research is how do we automate mathematics? That's the fundamental goal. This goal goes back to the uh, work of Hilbert, who in 1900 said that, you know, can we automate mathematics? That was Hilbert's 23rd question problem with respect to automation of first order logic. And his 10th problem was, can you uh, have a, a, come up with an algorithm to decide Diophantine equations? But the, the, the general sense was, you know, can we automate mathematics? And then in 1931, Gödel sh uh, showed that piano arithmetic is incomplete. And in 1936, Turing showed that first order logic is undecidable, meaning the even without getting into the weeds of what all of this means, uh, the implication of all of this is that mathematics is not automatable on the computer. Uh, having said that, though, um, considerable amount of work starting with Turing has been put in to automate mathematics, and we have a variety of tools right now. While they cannot obviously overcome the limits uh, put by uh, Gödel's and Turing's theorems, they can still do a lot, go a long way in automatically or semi-automatically proving mathematical theorems. And one such class of tools, as I mentioned, is the SAT solver, which is focused on a very simple logic called Boolean logic. And the problem within this context is that it's already very difficult as we because we uh, know that SAT problem is NP complete and in general believed to be intractable. With respect to first order theories, there is this whole space called SMT, satisfiability modulo theory, theories where the goal is similar. We, we are asking the same question as in the case of the Boolean, as in the case of Boolean logic, namely, uh, can you solve the satisfiability problem for various first order theories? First order theories such as linear arithmetic, uh, nonlinear arithmetic, um, partial differential equations, what have you. Right, so and people have built tools to solve these problems, and most of these tools, SAT and SMT solvers, are applied primarily in the area of finding bugs in software code or hardware systems, or proving correctness. So that's where I'm coming from. And to me, when I uh, and I've built many such SAT solvers and SMT solvers. One of them is the Maple SAT, a SAT solver. And to me, it was kind of very natural to ask the question, if I can find a bug using my solver in a piece of code, why can't I do the same with uh, by applying it to machine learning and to mathematical equations in general? Next slide, please. So here is a general purpose uh, kind of view of how SAT SMT solvers get applied. So. Uh, there are these program reasoning tools out there that take us input programs and specifications and they convert them into logical formulas and you give it to a SAT or SMT solver that then attempts to find an assignment that would correspond to a bug in this particular input program with respect to the specification. Anyway, continue, continue please. Next slide. So we applied this to a variety of fields. One of the things that we did 
one particular example where, where we applied this was to learn the Pythagorean theorem. In the context of the Pythagorean theorem, our goal was to output a formula C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. You all know this very well for right angle triangles. But so what is the auxiliary truth here? So, so the way we set up the experiment was we gave uh, uh, Pythagorean triples, uh, values of CAB that satisfies this equation as input to the machine learning model. And our auxiliary truth was the triangle inequality, which is a simpler statement. And you know, you could imagine that you probably knew this before you could figure out the Pythagorean theorem. So the triangle inequality states that A plus B greater than C, where A, B, C are the lengths of any triangle. And if your purported uh, uh, Pythagorean uh, equation violates the triangle inequality is inconsistent with the triangle inequality, then we have a counter example. So we feed that back and we go in this loop until we get the correct answer. Okay, next slide. So I'll, I'll go skip this in interest of time. We, we did this with genetic algorithm. If you could go to the slide on with results, because I can see that Lisa is on the there and I need to stop. Uh, keep going, please. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, I'll, I'll skip all this for now. So next slide. So the, what are the no, next slide, please? What are the results? So we were able to show that our system learns uh, 16 equations from the Feynman, uh, famous Feynman book, uh, whereas Eureka and Turing boss could not. And we did this with uh, much greater uh, data efficiency and uh, better discovery rate. Next slide. Uh, so next slide. <coughs> So yeah, so we are the conclusions are we are at very early stages of automated scientific discovery. The results presented here are among the earliest such results. And perhaps the most important takeaway of my talk is this corrective feedback loop between machine learning and logic. Next slide. And that's the end of my talk, and I'm more than happy to take questions at this point. Thank you again for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Professor Ganesh. Uh, that was very informative and again i don't have a, uh, a mathematics or computer science background so it's a little bit advanced for me i had to look up uh, again uh, sat and smt solvers or those problems so um we're just as we're waiting for some questions i was just uh going back to uh, uh the application or the uh, original problem that you were talking about with the um just looking over here the um goal to use mathematical expressions um, for the fundamental science uh, uh, development. How far along are you on that? What have you found? Like, um, I'm, so, I'm, this fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Automated scientific discovery is a very new field. And uh, there are many groups around the world that are working in this direction. We are at a very early, we are at a nascent stage in this field. I think anything meaningful is decades away. Um, there is a group at MIT by I think Max Tegmark uh, who has another tool called AI Feynman, which uh, also is a competing tool to ours. There's another group at Princeton that's working on this. Um, and people are coming up with a variety of techniques to, to um, automatically learn equations. There are uh, people who are focused without using domain knowledge, just using large uh, DNNs to do that. I, uh, there's a Shirley Ho is one person um, who's doing this and I believe in astrophysics, but don't quote me on that. So and, a lot of groups are working on this. And who are your partners? If you don't. Uh, well, in, in this, uh, it was mostly me and then Mason, my students, of course, uh, Dhananjay Ashok and Joe Scott, as I mentioned at the very beginning, and uh, Mason Panju, who wrote a PhD thesis on knowledge discovery at uh, the U Waterloo Statistics Department, uh, as well as Sebastian Wetzel from the Perimeter. Uh, they, these are all my uh, you know, colleagues yeah. I work with. But yeah. I'm more than happy to open this up and learn from others and work with others. Very excited about this field because it is another gateway to applying the core area that I work in, which is automation of mathematics through solvers. So this is, I could just find another application besides applying SAT and SMT solvers to software engineering, security, and AI. We have one more question. This is from Professor Erkmatz. Um, is it possible to pre-inform on certain symbolic models and let the proposed method come up with even more refined expressions? Yes, totally. You can you can limit the language in a very you know very particular way, or you can say use these terms as opposed to just symbols, 
and that would uh, help even more. Um, and yes, so and further, if you have a pre-trained model, uh, there's another line of work that I've been working in, working on, which is what's called as robust training. So if you think about this, this idea is not limited to automated scientific discovery. As uh, Professor Khan just mentioned, if I have a pre-trained model, can I make it better somehow using domain knowledge by adding, doing active learning? And I think this idea has uh, applications in that area, domain as well. OK, wonderful. Um, I think with that, I, again, I invite anybody else um, if they have any more questions that we can collect them. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I see that there is another question from Professor Van de Veel, but I'm not able to find that. Um, perhaps. Uh, so, so my apologies to Professor Vandeville. Um, I think we should move on and then we'll be able to connect you. As you said, uh, uh, take the conversation offline and get some good uh, ideas, partnerships, collaborations going that way. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank and Khan, do get back, you know, just email me and we can continue the conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for your attention. Oh, no, thank you very much. And next we will uh, move on to our speaker. Uh, George Shaker, who is an adjunct professor, adjunct associate professor. Um, he is the laboratory director of the wireless sensors and devices uh, group at the University of Waterloo, an associate professor of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, as well as Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering. Is, is Professor Shaker, there he is. So the, yeah, okay. I would I would like to introduce Professor Shaker on his talk, Low Cost Radars and Artificial Intelligence for Advanced Sensing. Welcome. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, today I'm, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, some of our work on low cost radars and how we used AI to do some advanced sensing features. Um, so a brief intro to my lab. Uh, my lab is called the Wireless Sensors and Devices Lab. Um, it is um, Focusing on uh, or it focuses on applied electromagnetics uh, with a wide diverse of applications. So, uh, of course, many of us know about the data transfer. So we do lots related to uh, 5G nowadays. Of course, we have done lots related to 4G and, and uh, GPS, Wi-Fi, BLE. We do lots on power transfer as well. So lots on the medical applications, lots on, on automotive and UAV, where we basically use EM and or electromagnetic waves to transfer power without having to have any direct connection. We also do lots in sensing, which is the focus of, of this talk. You can see lots of logos on this slide, and these are basically partners uh, who have uh, worked with us to uh, uh, contribute to advancing the research in a way, or some of them actually did license our technologies and, and are using them in actual products that are available in the market these days. Um, so I'll, I'll pick an example problem, and then we can walk through how we use the radars and, and basically AI to solve these problems. So one problem in the automotive domain and basically in cabin sensing, where there is a huge interest in first understanding if the driver is distracted or not. Also counting occupants, um, making sure that uh, we know the number of occupants in the car. That's, that's important for airbag deployments, for example, or for ride sharing applications. Um, another big application is uh, uh, gesture control or basically infotainment system control where uh, we can control the infotainment system without touching it, so which will keep the driver a bit less distracted. And uh, another very important uh, thing that we're trying to do as well is detect if there is an infant or a kid being left behind in a car. And um, this was a big issue because um, we year over year we get lots of unfortunate accidents where uh, younger infants are left in vehicles on a hot day and then unfortunately many of them die just because of the heat and because of, of uh, uh, the lack of ventilation in, in these hot days. So if you look at existing occupancy detection uh, technology, state of the art, we can basically identify them as either cameras or infrared cameras, uh, ultrasonic, and, and and mechanical. Of course, the mechanical issue is that you have to put one in every seat. And if you are thinking of the case of an infant, for example, it's very hard for mechanical sensors to identify if this is an infant or somebody just left a, a heavy uh, or not so heavy backpack, for example, in a seat, right? Um, so mechanical sensors can do the job much. Uh, cameras uh, and IR cameras in general have the issue of basically privacy where um, you, you can well, not not lots of people want to be 
uh, recorded on a camera um, all the time, especially that many of these cameras will send the data to the cloud for identification and stuff. They're not doing uh, advanced edge computing. So lots of issues, lots of privacy issues. And, and if you think about the edge computing aspect of it, where you're not sending any data out, you're doing everything locally on the cameras, the problem with these is they become very bulky and very expensive to uh, operate uh, for, for use cases like this. So we, we propose using radars and, and we'll see why radars can um, can be uh, an alternative, a good alternative in an application like this. Um, the, the whole idea for us is, OK, well, we'll try to put one of our radars, which we have been working on for a while, and somewhere uh, near the rear view mirror. So we, we could also put it somewhere in the center of the car, but we picked near the rear view mirror. And in this example, we're going to discuss a van, so a seven seater basically. And and the idea is, OK, so if we put it by the rear view mirror and, and we pick some, some of the radars, of course, they were, had lots of questions related to which frequency and what type of topology that we use for the radar, but let's not get into these for, for today. Uh, we just picked one, for example, and, and if you look at the just a, a basic review on the foundations of, of radars in general, um, the, the very basic principle is they generate, there is a waveform generation uh, 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 block and that block basically sends the data out and through hitting the object the person in this case we get some energy back and we do some radar processing and we can basically do some something we call range resolution so we can resolve range we can resolve velocity how fast the object is moving and we can resolve angle so how separated the objects are from each other uh, I think most of us are familiar with the velocity one because we got lots of tickets because of that uh, but the range and, and the angle are a bit trickier because um, in a car with all these reflections coming in from the, the car body, uh, these signals can be easily uh, uh, distorted. And one thing we have been working on is how to make sure that we're getting the best, cleanest, uh, what we call highest signal to noise ratio so that we can operate properly or, or uh, basically extract things properly from a system like this. The advantages of, of a radar system in general compared to the cameras, to the mechanical, is these ones are very, very low cost. We're looking at chipsets that are sub sub couple of dollars basically. So overall they consume very little power, they consume, um, uh, they cost very little, so and, and they preserve privacy. So in principle they should be able to help us in, in the applications we mentioned earlier. But we'll see some of the challenges when we put those in the vehicle uh, shortly. So this is the first challenge. So we picked them and again I'm not going to go into the details of why we picked a certain frequency, why for example we picked a certain radar which has three transmitters, four receivers, but let's let's say we picked this radar. That's um, uh, overall cost of something like this as I mentioned few dollars and nothing much and and we put it there and the problem though is when you have something like this if you don't design the antennas properly you could have what we call a uh, very low field of view across certain seats so for example if you take the the seats we discussed in the vehicle and if we do a full wave uh, electromagnetic simulations we look across the whole environment of the vehicle you'll notice that certain seats like five and six and seven are very well covered by the, the radar, uh, you can think of it as the radar camera, but seats three and four are very far away from the main lobe of this camera or the main field of view, which will cause certain issues with uh, later on with the signal processing and we sometimes we cannot compensate for those. So uh, one thing we did initially is, OK, let's change these antennas. Let's let's do something a bit more innovative so that we have a better field of view across the vehicle. So this means that the power across all seats is almost uniform, which will help us really in, in really going further and trying to do the more more advanced signal processing and extracting if there is somebody in the seat, for example, or not. Now, if we use the state of the art signal processing available, and this, this one particular is available from Texas Instruments, you can see that there is a big issue with the system trying to count the people inside the vehicle. And you can see this is the output from the, the system. Sometimes it's actually uh, reporting two passengers, three passengers, four, five, never six or seven actually. And, and the problem was the system is having issues because of the angle resolution limitation. And a system like this, if you look at the fundamentals of of the engineering uh, development of it, you will notice that because of the separation between the antennas here, we have a limit of angle resolution of 14 degrees. At a meter or a meter and a half, we're basically from the front uh, or from the rear view uh, mirror all the way to the back seat. That that basically translates to a distance that has to be over um, over half a meter roughly between the, the back passengers. So if they are close to each other, like the way it is here, the system is going to be having a hard time to figure out if this is one passenger or two at that, or like close to each other. Uh, it just suffers from that, and that's why the algorithm fails easily there. Um, 
Of course, one way to fix this is to have a more advanced chipset, more advanced system, where basically it can resolve more, uh, sorry, resolve less than in this case. So instead of 14 degrees, maybe we can go to one degree. Uh, so this is an implementation where we went and cascaded four chipsets, for example, uh, which in a way, uh, it's not just a four multiplier in the cost, it's actually more because there's some overhead on linking all these chipsets together. So you can think of this as additional cost, much additional cost, maybe five times more, uh, more complex uh, design actually. And, and because of the complexity of design, the overall system cost becomes much, much more uh, expensive compared to the simple use case one. So, but that's that's one way of doing it. That's one way of implementing it. The problem with this way though, is it cannot solve issues related to uh, clutter in the environment. So it can resolve, yes, and it can resolve up to one degree, but the problem is, or down to one degree, but the problem here is, what if the car is full of clutter? You will need even more, uh, like uh, less, res uh, more resolution in this case. So you can resolve less. So you can resolve maybe to half a degree or, or 0.1 degree, right? So it's it's just um, it becomes an endless problem this way. If if you want to improve the hardware, just uh, and of course it keeps increasing the complexity, keeps in increasing the cost. So we decided to go a completely different direction, and and the direction was what if we uh, basically build our platform so, so that we have um, the radar board on top of it. We do the advanced radar signal processing that we do, the range and the Doppler and the angle of arrival. But then on top of that, we do some machine learning. And the idea here was that, okay, with, with some new layer of machine learning, maybe we can be able to identify the number of occupants and location of occupants and, and even the, the nature of the occupant, whether it's an adult or a kid or an infant, without having to have the very, very complex um, uh, hardware requirements. And, and we actually did build uh, uh, to quite a, an extensive set of, of uh, experiments so that we can validate this, this assumption. So basically what we did is we, of course we had lots of volunteers involved to build the machine learning uh, libraries, but we also had, um, we built dummies. So these dummies will have motors inside them uh, or, or dolls in this case uh, where they have motors and the motors will move similar to the breathing waveform that we have from uh, regular uh, infants. And basically we built uh, so many or, or we, we designed a, a set of experiments where we cover different seats, uh, different locations, and uh, and we fed all of this to a machine learning engine. So lots of lots of combinations there. Um, a study that took us maybe about a um, couple of months of just a day, many, many experiments during the day, right? And, and recording all of this. But the results were really interesting because what we noticed is we can actually do very advanced classification with a very simple hardware without needing the complex hardware. And we could identify if a certain seat is uh, available or um, empty or not. And and actually with, with the machine learning as well, we could identify if there's an adult in that seat or a kid. Uh, so this was was really significant because uh, pairing the two together and and um, we could we could advance again as I said uh, like uh, not use a very complex hardware uh, platform but something very simple and and with the machine learning power we could do way way uh, more advanced um, sensing. Um, we extended the approach more to uh, do distracted driving detection. So basically, instead of the location near the rear view mirror, we uh, we put it by uh, almost by the dash there, and then we could actually track how the driver is is behaving during um, during a drive session. So uh, you could you could see that we can uh, detect if the driver is looking forward, looking sideways, um, whether they're looking backwards or looking, for example, right or left, or or looking at the phone. And again, this 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 was really interesting because the the computational power needed for something like this is all based on the Doppler and which is very it's a it's a native thing within the radar platform. But again, because of the resolution needed, the machine learning came in and, and helped a bit uh, uh, do what we call a super resolution using the radar system in this case. Um, this work was was highly regarded. Actually, we we, we got featured on CNN. Uh, I got invited to speak at the US Congress. Um, it's actually became a, something part of the Hot Cars Act. So now by 2025, many of the vehicles will have will have these sensors. Uh, uh, Japanese OEM actually did commercialize this idea, so it's uh, uh, you, you will find it coming in the Teslas as well. So it's it's been a, it's been quite some interesting project here. Um, the the idea. Basically, I would say it's the same principles, but we applied it for different applications. So we did this in tangible interaction. We did this in, in vital signs, lots of bio applications, lots of other applications. And, and just I'll, I'll, I'll show you a glimpse of those. So for example, infotainment uh, gesture control. Again, same idea, a, what we call AI powered or machine learning powered uh, radar sensing. So in this case, for example, we had um, a Cadillac 
and basically the student will, will just do a simple gesture. Uh, so actually, uh, let me scroll back a bit here. So this is actually the whole platform. This is the, it's a compact platform. We, we actually paired this platform to the infotainment system in the vehicle. And basically the student will do a very simple gesture and, and that will trigger uh, uh, the, uh, the infotainment system to start the dialer and then she can do a phone call in this case and then eventually when she's done the phone call she can she can basically uh, do another gesture and that will hang up the call um so um the similar things with vital signs actually we common thing is, is trying to identify or, or monitor sleep apnea and if any of you have done through this exercise it's a very very tough exercise because you'll have to sleep at a sleep clinic with lots of wires attached to you it's never the natural way of, of sleeping actually uh, so one thing we've done is instead of, of regular um, lots of wires basically we put our radar system into the ceiling and we we use the algorithms coming from that to to basically able to extract breathing rate heart rate um, and monitor sleep apnea incidents we can actually monitor multiple uh, patients at the same time so we have done this where again put it in the ceiling there and we can track the breathing rate heart rate of multiple uh, um, participants uh, so so in covid as well sorry so it's uh, with co uh, uh well, i have to go back to this slide <laughs> so uh so with the with with covid we could actually uh, extract lots of instances like coughing swallowing and and basically we integrated the system near the tv so if you're watching tv for example we can look at the person and then we can identify uh, there's so many increased coughing for example having difficulty breathing and and all of these signals which is almost like remote ecg uh, we have been reporting to medical uh, professionals actually to look at. We we actually did something uh, which is uh, a bit uh, interesting, and and we have we have done the first of its kind research basically on on health impacts of inactivity, and this was featured big time and 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 the news actually recently about a year ago when we started. We just completed a, a long term study at at uh, Montreal University Health Center where we uh, ran a campaign across many volunteers, many patients to basically monitor them without any wires, without anything. So it's basically uh, radar systems only. And and the idea again is to extract as much uh, vital information regarding their health with a very simple, relatively low cost system and, and shoving everything to the cloud where we do advanced machine learning, advanced AI to extract all the data that we're looking for. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pause here. I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, and we're we're right on time too. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, there's, I can hear. I think there's a bit of a, an echo. And um, I just absolutely love, uh, especially all of the very like real applications that are being used like right now are very close. Um, I am thrilled to see all of all of this, uh, all of these advancements. Um, and I think you pretty much answered all the questions that I had uh, originally just. Um, so I'm just wondering who are your industrial partners? And I apologize if you meant, mentioned that earlier um, and I missed it. So a big part of, of this research has been uh, funded by Google. So Google, uh, I have a Google Research Award, so that's that's one of them. Uh, we have uh, Canada Space Agency, that's another one. Uh, we have uh, Tidal Medical, which is uh, a Toronto-based startup, uh, basically started by a few MDs, cardi cardiologists. So they are part of the team now supporting us. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, I should mention Infineon and TI, they're, they're very close partners, so they're providing us the chipsets. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a short list there. Oh, and and then very quickly, what's your uh, five or ten year projection? What are we what are we looking at there? Uh, I think readers are are coming to uh, play a big role in, in multiple industries. Uh, in automotive, I think they're they're doing a key key role in, in sensing in uh, healthcare. Again, very advanced role, especially in remote healthcare. Uh, I think more and more people are recognizing the need for that and the idea of uh, asking patients to dingle with wires and and put them on is, is problematic because they may may miss putting them on uh, if if you're servicing a, a large um, area for example with lots of people coming in then the nurses have to clean after all each of them so one system that is touchless in a way that can do this is, is becoming uh, of a significant need and i think uh, we're going to see more and more deployments of this in the near future for sure Oh, that's wonderful. Can't wait. We're, we've been waiting for that and that'll help us a lot. As I say, the yeah. democratization of healthcare. Like, yeah. uh, uh, do, we don't have to live in a big city and have lots of money to to get proper proper health care. That's thank the hypothesis, you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that uh, wonderful and inspiring and uh, very positive and good energy talk. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Thanks. Susan. OK, and then next. I would like to introduce Professor Roger Melko. Uh, Professor Hi Melko, 
How are you? <laughs> Good. Am I coming through? You are. Let me let me give you a few words of lead in and then we'll jump right in. So Professor okay. Melko is uh, at the University of Waterloo and also associate faculty at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physicists uh, for Th Theoretical Physics and is also a Canada Research Chair in Computational Quantum Many Body Physics. That was a mouthful, and I bet you <laughs> Professor Melko could uh, talk about that a little bit better than I can. Please, uh, let's welcome Professor Melko on his talk, Generative Models and Quantum Computers. Okay, thanks so much. Um, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I would uh, just like to tell a little bit of the kind of story of, uh, I'd say, the unsupervised machine learning that uh, is going on at our um, in our research group at the University of Waterloo in the Perimeter Institute. And the Perimeter Institute has an AI lab, which uh, I run called, that we call the Quantum Intelligence Lab. And you'll see the members uh, in this in this picture here, uh, taken during the summer, uh, you know, during a lull in the pandemic. And it's basically a group of physicists, generally theoretical physicists, who uh, specialize in quantum, uh, you know, quantum mechanics, quantum computing, uh, but have taken a, an interest in, uh, uh, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we partner uh, with, uh, you know, not only the Institute for Quantum Computing uh, here on campus, but also uh, the Creative Destruction Labs in uh, Toronto and the Quantum Machine Learning Stream and the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, where I'm at a, uh, an affiliate faculty. Thanks. Next slide, Jake. Uh, yeah, so just a brief uh, kind of, I guess, motivation for uh, some of the work that we do. Uh, and as you might guess, you know, our conventional computing hardware is this day and age, you know, largely reliant on uh, other you know, computers uh, to design, uh, at, you know, and also do a lot of the control, uh, you know, elements of, of, uh, of sort of um, algorithms. So the world's fastest conventional computers are already, uh, you know, being co-opted for the design characterization readout and control of, of today's quantum hardware. So our group works closely with laboratories who are building quantum uh, computing hardware in order to sort of integrate artificial intelligence and machine learning as part of this process. Okay, and partially it's in the design stage. So a lot of what we do in terms of quantum computing uh, is, you know, design and sort of simulate uh, hardware. And so we know its capabilities. Uh, but then, you know, to a to another degree, uh, machine learning has become very integral in sort of the readout and control of that hardware. Uh, so, and, and I won't, uh, you know, maybe talk too much about that, but maybe give you a bit of an example. Next. Thanks. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, you know, there's many kind of places where machine learning enters in to a quantum computer. And, you know, you could imagine uh, a quantum computer, an analogy to a classical computer, in the sense that there's a technology stack, okay? And at the bottom of the stack is what we're typically kind of interested in when we think about quantum computers, and that's qubits, uh, you know, connectivity, uh, sort of all these, uh, you, know, you know, beautiful devices that are being built in lab laboratories, both at the ITC and around the world. Uh, but there's a lot more that goes into, as you can guess, any computer. And above the physical qubits, uh, which I've illustrated some candidates on the right. You know, we have uh, trapped ions, uh, you know, ultra cold quantum gases. We have superconducting quantum circuits. We have more sort of conventional solid state qubits, all which are being explored um, both at the Institute for Quantum Computing and elsewhere. So above this kind of physical layer, I mean, there's a, there's a whole stack of technology that goes from, uh, you know, the control sequences, the you know, sort of the pulses that are being generated. Uh, in order to, uh, you know, sort of manipulate the quantum information and so on. Uh, to above that, to error correction, which is an integral part of any quantum computer, uh, you know, just like your classical computer computers, uh, to, you know, the logical gates that are applied to the error correcting qubits, to sort of that higher level, which we can maybe equate to things like, um, you know, assembler language and higher. So you can have all, you know, sorts of compilers and so on uh, uh, kind of up on that stack. And so I'm generally working in the lowest levels of the stack when I'm talking about um, uh, machine learning, but machine learning has a role in all of these, uh, you know, an artificial intelligence's role in all layers of the stack, including the upper layers, which, uh, you know, kind of abstract us into uh, some kind of more uh, higher level languages and compilers and so on. Next. I just wanted to give a very brief analogy, uh, you know, for those who aren't quantum physicists, kind of maybe what the power of quantum computing is. 
And I think this is a very neat analogy that doesn't get into block spheres and entanglement and things like that that seem a little more esoteric. And I just want to mention that, you know, uh, a quantum computer uh, is kind of an analogy to a classical computer uh, in many different ways. Uh, but one uh, abstraction that I think is valuable in sort of our von Neumann uh, computing architecture is to consider how we store information. So in a classical hard drive, which I've illustrated, I guess that icon looks a little old now in the, in the era of solid state drives. But just, you know, if you imagine that you have a, a, com a computer hard drive, really, you know, that, that hard drive represents a state of information in the computer. And that state is one of many bit arrangements, right? And so I've illustrated black and white uh, sort of, you know, pixels as maybe, you know, physical, classical bits being up or down, on or off, whatever they are. And of course, there's a large number of possible arrangements of the bits on your hard drive. Actually, you know, if you have n bits, there's two to the n possible arrangements, right? And, you know, which I've illustrated there. And you can imagine the computer, in some sense, as a Turing machine, you know, takes uh, you may be a sequence of these bits, perform some operation, uh, and then changes the state of that information. And if it wrote it to disk, then you would get, you know, another one of those states. So the hard drive exists in kind of an instantaneous state and is manipulated into other states. And that's all your, you know, whatever. On the left, there's a picture of a cat. You know, on the right is a picture of a dog. All the, all, you know, all the classical information. Next slide. So in analogy, I like to think of a quantum computer, at least a quantum hard drive, which are being built in many laboratories, uh, uh, including Rajwal Islam, my collaborator in super quantum computer. So I've illustrated, I've taken it, I actually went to the lab. I'm a theorist, if you haven't figured it out. I don't really know what's going on in these labs, but I took a, a photo with my iPhone be, you know, before the pandemic. So there's Rajwal Islam's quantum hard drive over at IQC. What's different about that quantum hard drive, which traps cold, you know, ultra cold sort of ionic gases, you know, in, in interacting laser beams? What's the difference between that and a classical hard drive? Really, it's that the state of that hard drive isn't in any one of those, uh, you know, pixelized states like the classical. It's an all possible uh, quantum. It's in all possible states at the same time. Uh, so on the previous slide, I had, you know, you could either be in, you know, one pixelized state, another pixelized state, and so on. Here, what I'm saying is that you can be in all of them simultaneously uh, and with, you know, these coefficients, which tell you uh, sort of like the uh, the amount that each one of those states contributes to your quantum information. Okay, so it's just a very different paradigm than a classical computer. Uh, you know, it takes the superposition states, and by the way, those Cs, those coefficients can be complex. Uh, and, and, you know, it manipulates the information uh, contained in that superposition uh, over all possible two to the n states. And so it's just a very different way of thinking about quantum or it's thinking about information. Next slide. And, you know, one pro problem that we work on in my group, just one of many problems, is the question of how do you read this hard drive, right? So you know how you might read a magnetic hard drive or a solid state hard drive for classical information, but how do you read it uh, in, the, in the quantum case? And the kind of complication is that when you have that hard drive made up of that superposition of all two to the n possible kind of bit configurations, uh, by quantum mechanics, we know that you know, a single measurement or a reading of that hard drive collapses the wave function into only one of those possible configurations and it does so probabilistically you know which you know the probability is kind of the the mod square of the amplitude so reading a quantum hard drive is equivalent to the process of reconstructing you know the entire probability distribution or the entire quantum state because there can be complex amplitudes from more than one measurement it's actually multiple measurements which which take a lot of resources next slide and so one way to do this is through generative models and if you, you know, are a, a aficionado of generative models, you probably are used to the idea of deep fakes. So here I've taken uh, pictures from Vox Celeb 2 dataset, uh, which is, you know, you can find on this archive paper. On the left is, uh, you know, one photo of a celebrity. On the right are deep fakes, you know, generated photos uh, of these celebrities in different poses, which we don't actually have data for. You know, hence generative modeling, right? Somehow in, inside the layer of this generative, inside the latent space of this generative model, uh, we can manipulate images so that we can produce, let's call them samples, you know, new samples of, of, of images that haven't been seen before. So on the next slide, you'll see that 
uh, you know, if you if you're used to any sort of generative models, you might recognize these being generated by a GAN. And again, you know, generative adversarial network is one of the sudden kind of premier uh, generative uh, kind of premier generative models that's being used in industry. And Ian Goodfellow, who you know uh, is kind of the inventor of the GAN, uh, you know, actually laid out a fairly nice hierarchy of uh, generative models uh, in kind of the original uh, Neurops paper in, in 2017 here. And so GANs lie on the maximum likelihood implicit density side of things. And you know, they're only one of a number of generative models that we in our group explore uh, for the reconstruction of quantum states. Um, there's two more uh, slides. Uh, Jacob, maybe you can just go through them both real quick. Yeah, this one and the next one. And so two of the architectures that we uh, look at a lot of my group is the restricted Bolton machine, which is on one side of this hierarchy. It's called the implicit uh, uh, likelihood or not uh, uh, non-tractable likelihood because these are non-normalized probability distributions. And just to give you a flavor of other research in my group, you know, we, do, we also do a lot of work on uh, natural language processing models, uh, including uh, recurrent neural networks and other types of autoregressive structures. So all of these generative models that I just talked about, they're capable of taking data from a quantum computer, uh, you know, representing or storing, if you will, the probability distribution or the, the quantum state. Uh, they can be generalized to complex numbers. Uh, and they're very expressive. They're very powerful. Uh, they can be trained on a reasonable amount of data. Uh, and, and, you know, they have some sort of inductive biases, which we can tune to kind of help us out in the quantum world. Uh, and they can be sampled efficiently, you know, to, to produce new quantum states that haven't been seen before by, uh, you know, these, the quantum apparatuses that we use to train them. Okay, so we, we actually explore a number of these types of generative model architectures. Next slide. And why, again, just to kind of reiterate, quantum experiments are extremely expensive. And I don't just mean money, I also mean time. <laughs> so, you know, every time a measurement is taken of a quantum hard drive, it collapses the state of that hard drive and this, the hard drive has to be reprepared. That's very different than a classical hard drive where you read it, the information is still there, no problem, right? If there's any issue, you can read it again. Every time you read a quantum hard drive, uh, you know, you collapse the wave function. And so you can see, I just like my favorite picture of a quantum computer on the right there. You just see all the data cables streaming out of that table. You know, there's just such a large amount of data that's being produced by these devices. And it's being produced at certain frequencies that, uh, you know, we would like to be higher, but it takes a lot of technology. So generative models can help to kind of enhance low frequency data. OK, so like, you know, if that if I only get a few shots per second off of that optical table, uh, generative models can help kind of interpolate. And I've just shown two probability distributions. You can guess what they are. On the left hand side, I've, I've basically sampled the distribution with hundreds of thousands of shots and I get a nice kind of clean distribution. On the right hand side, I've only used a few, uh, I think a couple thousand shots and you can see it's very choppy. So there's lots of likelihood, uh, you know, uh, there's lots of the histogram missing. And so what a generative model in one sense does is it's like the red. I can fit a model with a limited number of parameters whether they're neural network weights or biases or whatever, they kind of smooth out that distribution. Uh, so we do a lot of work on sort of the, uh, I guess I would say the fundamental uh, power of neural networks and how they react to quantum data in this sense. Next slide, Jacob. Um, and let me just end with two examples. Uh, one is a neutral atom quantum computer, a very large computer uh, that's built in the laboratories at Harvard University by Misha, Luka, Misha Lukin, uh, pictured on the right, who's a collaborator of mine. Uh, these are Rydberg atoms, which on the device on the left, I mean, they're basically trapped with optical, com uh, sorry, optical tweezers, and they're manipulated into a quantum state. And on the right, you see a readout of that quantum state on a roughly, I think it's 16 by 16, roughly um, uh, you know, two dimensional grid. So you should kind of think of the analogy of that readout, and now it's fully occupied with atoms, as being the analogy of a picture of a cat or a picture of a dog. And really what we're trying to do is learn the probability distribution that underlies all possible pictures of cats in some sense when we, when we want to learn the quantum wave function. So just as illustrating how this is useful uh, and, and with some concrete numbers, we took 300 measurements uh, off this quantum computer. Uh, we trained a generative model and then after training, we sampled the model. And on the next slide, you'll see uh, here's the result of that. 
On the right, you see GT is ground truth. Okay, so we, we know a model for this. XP is the experiment and RBM is the generative model. And just whatever that is, just think about on the right, all that data corresponding uh, to each other is like that one picture of Einstein or Marilyn Monroe that we actually have. You know, we can reconfirm the fact that we, you know, uh, can train a model to represent this quantum state. On the right hand side, for the physicists, this is an off the angle uh, estimator that we don't have any access to directly in the experiment. And what the generative model allows us to do, it's like those pictures. It's like pictures of Einstein that you haven't seen before, <laughs> you know, but are basically plausible. And as you can see, there's some discrepancy between the ground truth and the generative model, the RBM there. And that's exactly what helps experimentalists out. You know, we can look at the experiment, just like Einstein's face, from different angles. And, and you know, uh, those different angles tell us a lot about the behavior of the quantum computer and how we can improve it, uh, you know, sort of experimentally. Next slide. Oh, and I just also wanted to mention that we do a lot of this work on campus. Again, here's Rajabal Islam, uh, Yin Hong To, who's a student uh, between ourselves and Perimeter, and Stephanie Siszczek, who's a postdoc at Perimeter. And, uh, you know, we take, uh, again, ion data from Rajabal's quantum hard drive uh, and basically try to do all sorts of things, uh, including time series prediction. Uh, so here's elements of a density matrix. You know, we've trained a generative model on the gray shaded region uh, and then unrolled an RNN in the same way that you would do, uh, you know, like text completion with like GPT-3 or some transformer. You know, we unroll it to try to predict the behavior of that single qubit. That's a single qubit Rabi oscillation in Rajabal's experiment, uh, which helps us kind of predict the, the state of the, of the, uh, of the quantum computer and, and, and helps us also increase the frequency at which we can read out the qubit state. So this is like, you know, improving the clock speed of a quantum computer um, by orders of magnitude using, you know, natural language processing tools. And, you know, expect to see a lot more of that in the future, uh, sort of this interplay between uh, artificial intelligence tools adopted from AI and machine learning industry into quantum computing. Next slide. Uh, just to say, you know, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, if you're interested, <laughs> contact me. Uh, there's a lot of fundamental questions about what quantum states can be accurately represented uh, by classical, you know, basically generative models. That's a big open question. And we're working with lots of people, including the biggest quantum computers, inclu uh, including uh, John Martinez's uh, machine that he built for Google at UC Santa Barbara. We're, we're looking at fundamental questions about algorithmic, I'd say, complexity and optimization complexity. Uh, because quantum computing problems are often turned into optimization problems. Uh, and we're also looking at a lot of different architectures that come from industry. Uh, you know, I showed results for restrictive Boltzmann machines and RNNs, recurrent neural networks. Uh, but of, as many of you should know, you know, transformers are very powerful. Uh, and there's a lot of work uh, recently to ask if, what, whether transformers can give sort of transformative uh, ch you know, results in terms of uh, these generative modeling tasks for quantum computers. And I got one more slide just very quickly in conclusion. Uh, unsupervised learning with generative models is we already use it. It's already basically being hybridized, I would suspect, in every quantum computer on the planet right now uh, by groups uh, you know, all over the world. Uh, it's certainly going to be an integral part of, of quantum computing going forward. Uh, and you know, quant uh, artificial intelligence itself, in some sense, has been optimized for industry application. Here's another industry application that's not really computer vision, not really language processing. Uh, you know, it's not really something that's appropriate necessarily for, uh, you know, current um, reinforcement learning application. So I'd say there's a lot of fundamental work still that can be done uh, on, uh, you know, this aspect of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, and, you know, we still don't know kind of where, you know, when quantum computers will become more powerful than classical computers. And I would argue that machine learning and, and sort of implementation and knowledge of machine learning uh, will be integral in, in answering this. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you, Jacob, for managing my slides. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, wow, um, I'm going to call it mind-blowing uh, <laughs> uh, research. Uh, again, I'm, I'm such a novice um, at uh, uh, any of the research aspects of it. So this, uh, so quantum AI, is just such a a new and powerful field um 
uh, just reading a few a few magazines, and I think it was in The Economist, actually maybe two, three years ago, and they're talking about, you know, the quantum computers is still in the proof of concept stage, you know, you know, are we still at the Sputnik stage of, of so do you have comments on that? And um, also, oh, no, please go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I was just thinking. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so what, okay, so let me answer. One point is that, uh, you know, quantum computers themselves can be used to enhance artificial intelligence tasks. And what I'm doing here is kind of using artificial intelligence to enhance current quantum computers. But I hope one one point of uh, that gets across, and maybe I think your question highlights it, is that these things are becoming inseparable in some way. Um, you know, when as, as we build a device you know, as complicated as a quantum computer, we essentially have to use artificial intelligence. It has intrinsic complexities in it that the human mind just can't sort of get around, right? And so we're getting to the point where we built a machine with AI. I mean, that's that's true. Now the question is, can that machine help enhance AI tasks? And, and you might be thinking of like industry tasks. I think that's a, an excellent question and certainly a direction the field's going. Uh, no, I, again, I... I just want to know so much more and like what is that what is the six month you know one year two year five year 40 year uh, uh, milestones and things like that and I it's it makes me so proud to be a uh, part of the University of Waterloo and affiliated from with the perimeter Institute to say this is like this is like the impactful groundbreaking work that we're doing so Absolutely. thank you so much for doing that I, I oh I just had a quick question I'm waiting to see if there's some. I think uh, a lot of people in our audience are just so impressed and kind of dumbfounded. It's like going, I don't want to say anything that's really dumb. Not at all. <laughs> so, so thank you. And um, oh no, just just uh, looking forward to seeing uh, like just every little bit of advancement and just to see this is now science fact. It's no longer in a science fiction novel or in a in a in a, in a, in a movie, uh, a Marvel movie or something. Yeah. I, you know, excellent point. I think a year or two ago, people were wondering, well, will AI and quantum be, you know, somehow, you know, combined? I'm going to say it's it's happening so quickly that when if you blink, you're, you're going to miss it. So we build now quantum computers with artificial intelligence, period. That's oh, that's going to impress all my friends that I tell them <laughs> that. Well, this is really, really impressive. And again, thank you for all Thanks that you so do. Thanks so much, Lisa. And uh, and um, we'll we'll be following uh, these advancements very closely. So thank you very much. Thank you, much. Lisa and Jacob. Thank you. Okay, and then we will go on to our next speaker. Uh, is Professor Wu available? Oh, there you are. Excellent. Okay, our next speaker is Professor Yimin Wu, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering and is, is, of course, a Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology member, so that's why I know him. And he is also director of the Materials Interfaces Foundry at the University of Waterloo. Uh, let's all welcome him and his talk, Brain Inspired Computing for Artificial Intelligence. Take it away, Yimin. Thank you, Lisa. Can you hear my voice? I can hear you and your slides are clear. OK, good. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Waterloo AI and Wing uh, to provide this uh, wonderful workshop. Um, today, I want to share with you um, of my research uh, on brain-inspired computing for uh, artificial intelligence. I would like to introduce um, um, the motivation of, my, of these uh, research topics and then the introduction of uh, memoristers. Then I will uh, move on to give uh, two examples uh, from my uh, research group, uh, one on versatile uh, memoristers, and uh, the other one on flexible memoristers, both for uh, neuromorphic computing. So machine, in, machine learning based uh, artificial intelligence uh, has, uh, has a profound uh, impact uh, in societies. However, the machine learning um, uh, based uh, artificial intelligence, um, as many people mentioned, it needs uh, to process a huge amount of data and these require uh, better memories and also um, uh, faster uh, processing speed in the hardware uh, for, for these uh, type of applications. It is uh, um, 
highly time consuming process uh, with a required amount of electricity. Uh, if we use a traditional uh, Van Neumann uh, architecture computer, this is because the memory units are separated uh, um, with the processing unit in the uh, Van Neumann architectures. Uh, this data can be shuttled back and forth uh, during the uh, processing, so and that's why um, it can slow down the processing times and also get a lot of gener generate a lot of heat and for the uh, for the uh, for the from the data processing. Just to give you an um, idea, so five percent to fifteen percent of world total energy is spent in these uh, uh, data manipulations uh, and transmissions and processing. Uh, if we can mimic the human brains uh, to process uh, our data at the same locations uh, uh, with, uh, in the memory units, and then it can be at least uh, uh, 1,000 times uh, faster and, uh, and more, more energy efficient than the traditional uh, Van Neumann architectures. This can uh, greatly reduce the uh, carbon footprint uh, from the uh, fossil fuels uh, based uh, uh, electricity. Oops. Uh, one of the applications of um, Memristor is to give is to give uh, uh, to develop these um, uh, hardware-based uh, neuromorphic computing for uh, pattern recognitions. Uh, many speakers uh, previously mentioned about uh, uh, this uh, pattern recognition has a, a wide uh, range of applications uh, in identifying fingerprints in the uh, in uh, private. Uh, privacy safeties and also um, in the uh, criminal detections, um, diagnosis, uh, um, diseases diagnosed, uh, for example, taking a look at the images uh, from your uh, from the lamp. Uh, and also it can be used as a chip uh, in uh, autonomous uh, vehicle drivings. And the market for these uh, pattern recognitions in the North America is uh, continuously grows uh, exponentially. So in order to realize this uh, pattern recognitions uh, with high accuracy and, uh, and big data uh, storage and processing, so we need to develop a, a memoryster as a kind of a, a one of the uh, uh, one kinds of a hardware. There are four basic elements uh, in the electrical circuits. Uh, one is a charge or current, voltage and mag a magnetic flux. And the correlation of each other can provide the basic components of uh, uh, circuits. For example, the resistors is the correlation between the voltage and uh, the current, and capacitor is the uh, relationship between the uh, the charge and and uh, and the uh, voltage. And also the inductors uh, is a relationship between the magnetic magnetic flux uh, with a uh, current. And uh, but there is a uh, uh, one. Uh, one missing within element, uh, which is uh, uh, not uh, discovered uh, for uh, for many decades. Um, the three other components are, are discovered a um, long time ago, uh, not until uh, 1971. Um, uh, Leon Leon Chuang, uh, who predicted theoretically um, the existence of a uh, memristors. But this uh, was not realized until 2008 in HP companies, and in it was published in this uh, Nature paper, and then um, it um, it becomes uh, uh, gets a lot of attention for the um, to for the research in memoristors. So we can use. Um, we can use a memoryster uh, crossbar arrays as a hardware for neuromorphic computing. The resistor itself um, showing this uh, uh, simple linear relationship between voltage and current. The memoristors uh, usually show this uh, hysteresis loop, and the resistance is depending on uh, one or more internal states of the device. For example, in this uh, uh, binary uh, binary resistance states, uh, a low resistance state, uh, which is uh, uh, showing uh, in, in here, and then uh, the high resistance states uh, uh, showing uh, uh, at a lower current. And this resistance uh, can be changed uh, gradually uh, based on the pulse voltage. And 
we can use this uh, pulse voltage uh, to mimic the human brain as an integrated uh, and fine model as um, uh, as a, a synapses, artificial synapses. And that is uh, um, that is the uh, reasons of why it is uh, called uh, uh, artificial synapses and, and, all, and also the um, artificial uh, neurons. It has uh, a lot of advantages of using this uh, memristor as a building block uh, for neuromorphic computing. So it can achieve um, a very small size using the state-of-art nanofabrication techniques and it can achieve a fast switching speed. And also the, um, the most advantages is to uh, have this low power consumption using these kind of uh, devices. So there are lots of uh, uh, switching mechanisms uh, in memristors um, um, I just listed here. It includes uh, electrochemical uh, metallization, balance state changes, uh, iron diffusions, uh, hero junction barrier uh, modification, even phase change materials, and the ferroelectricities. And most recently, there's a, re uh, there's a paper uh, from Samsung's uh, realizing the uh, uh, spin talk uh, uh, kind of mechanisms in, uh, in memoristors for neuromorphic computings. So um, in here, I just uh, show in two kinds of mechanisms of which we uh, uh, use it widely. One is so-called electrochemical metallization memories. Um, the mechanism based on that is uh, the formation and rupture of the uh, metal conductive filaments uh, between the electrodes. And this can um, present in the hysteresis loop uh, of the typical uh, memristor's behaviors. And also we can use the uh, balance state change in, in, the, in the metal oxide to realize this kind of uh, uh, device functions. So in the following, um, I will show you uh, two examples from my research lab. Um, the first one, uh, we build up, we use this uh, bottom up approach to fabricate um, uh, the crossbar um, memristor structures. This can maximize the materials uh, utilization just using the single bath uh, electrode depositions. And, and this can um, kind of like um, um, uh, uh, reduce a lot of uh, materials waste and for the sustainable elec electronics. And uh, x-ray uh, x-ray diffractions are showing the crystal structure for Indian uh, copper, Indian selenium, and the EDX are showing the homogeneous uh, composition across the functional layers. With, this is the optical images we fabricated uh, uh, into these uh, crossbar arrays. So we investigate the um, uh, retention time and the different uh, temperatures and um, voltages. Uh, it demonstrates uh, these uh, uh, non-volatile uh, memory functions. With the same kind of devices, uh, we, can, uh, we can also realize the selectors functions, um, artificial synapses functions, and artificial uh, neuron functions. So when we apply the voltage uh, pulse to the artificial uh, synapses uh, using these uh, devices, uh, we can see um, we can see this uh, increase of uh, uh, conductance, and this phenomenon mimics uh, uh, mimics the uh, synapses response um, after after the external uh, stimulations, and these devices can can show in this. Uh, um, um, ex uh, um, potentiation and depressions uh, with these uh, short pulse intervals, which is showing as this result here. By using this uh, um, deep machine learning and using the artificial neural networks, we achieved uh, uh, pattern recognition uh, accuracy of uh, over 90% using these uh, devices. And the same device can also behaves as uh, artificial neurons uh, after we using the uh, using this uh, pulse train uh, in this uh, in this uh, designed uh, electrical circuits so we also uh, the, the next next uh, uh, example from my research lab uh, recently uh, we fabricate um, the flexible artificial synapses uh, for neuromorphic computing Using a, um, um, using a soft soft biomaterials, 
And since we can use this uh, soft biomaterial, so it becomes uh, flexible so on the on the substrate. And this uh, system can be used as a, as a wearable electronics uh, for neuromorphic computings um, in, in, in the future. By building these devices uh, onto, onto this uh, PET substrate uh, using these uh, sandwich structures, um, we, can, we can see the uh, transparency of these, um, these devices. Um, these, these type of devices showing a typical hysteresis loop as a as a memory uh, with the with the pulse um, into with, with the pulse train, we can we can show this um, uh, potentiation and depressions uh, as an artificial synapses. Uh, most uh, impressive thing is uh, we can we can measure the uh, this uh, uh, potentiation and depressions and the different uh, bending conditions because it's uh, flexible and these uh, potentiation and depressions can maintain uh, relatively stable after many cycles, even at different bending conditions. Uh, again, uh, we're using these uh, deep neural networks and, and to perform the uh, pattern recognitions. And uh, here we, we can achieve above 95% uh, of accuracies using these uh, deep, uh, deep neural networks uh, for the pattern recognitions. So in summary here, uh, we, we can, uh, I talk about uh, um, the mo motivation for memoristers and the motivations for pattern recognitions and also the current uh, Manoyman uh, architectures, uh, the, uh, the short, uh, the uh, disadvantages of uh, data storage uh, inefficiencies, but with uh, uh, neuromorphic computing, so we, we hope we can overcome this uh, data uh, storage inefficiencies and open the door for the big data storage and open a door for big data uh, processing. And I, I introduce uh, Memristas device switching mechanisms and give you um, uh, two examples on, on uh, versatile uh, Memristas and uh, flexible Memristas uh, for neuromorphic computing. Last uh, but not the least, I would like to thank uh, all the graduate students and postdocs in my uh, in my lab, uh, especially the PhD student um, Tao Guo who performed this type of uh, these two projects. And I would like to thank the uh, founding agencies uh, uh, for supporting the research in my group. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Wu, for this this talk. Um, now, memristors, like my quick question is, what state are they at now uh, compared to like just what what I have on my desk uh, to to save my data? Yeah, this this type of technology is uh, uh, as the keynote speaker uh, mentioned in the morning. This is a uh, uh, quite at uh, quite uh, um, close to market technologies. Um, the IBM um, um, implement these uh, neuromorphic computings. Uh, uh, programs uh, several years ago, not not uh, uh, not too long, uh, and and this ha has some uh, products uh, in the market uh, uh, already, and uh, there are some several uh, startups uh, in the North America, is, uh, especially in uh, in US. Uh, uh, there is a company called Crossbar, uh, which are kind of uh, producing these uh, uh, memoristors uh, chips uh, for the for for, uh, for for variety of applications. What, um, so you mentioned something is already available on market. What, uh, who is selling it? What form is it? Um. Uh, it's, um, it's mainly, um, um, it's mainly in this uh, uh, customer design chips. And I also know okay. there is, um, uh, recently there is a, a startup company from University of Michigan and uh, who, who, uh, who recruited uh, the former uh, CEO of, um, of, uh, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, the Micron, former CEO of Micron, uh, to become uh, part of the journey to uh, commercialize these uh, uh, memorister type of uh, uh, devices. Um, there's a lot of going on uh, on the um, on this field, and um, this technology is very close to the market. Oh, fabulous, fabulous! I have just one more comment. Especially, um, I see. Uh, are you a member of IEEC, like uh, Interdisciplinary Center for Climate Change? Are you yes, part of I'm, that? Yes. And because I know some of your other research is yeah. directly related to climate change, I again, I I know very little about this, but just. Um, 
how or if it's possible to comment, how does this technology in memristors assist with the problem that society is facing now with waste data storage? Or uh, I hope I'm not I'm uh, in that how much energy is taken uh, with so many files saw, uh, saved on on the cloud and things like that that have been almost abandoned, but they're still taking much more time. Is is that something that you can comment on or is uh, perhaps I've missed the point completely. Exactly, you you, you hit the point. This okay. is one of the motivations uh, for memristors. Uh, we try to do these uh, um, data storage and data processing at the same location, and this will um, uh, reduce the redundant files, the data uh, to, to be generated, and also uh, save the energy, which is a uh, consumption uh, for the uh, data processing. To give you an idea, so they predict in 2024, um, the data process, the energy which is consumed in data processing will exist, will exceed the current energy we will, we will, uh, we will generate. So this is a big problem. So we want, we want to uh, using, using the technology to bring down the energy consumption for the data processing and also reduce the, uh, the redundant uh, um, data generation as well. Wonderful. And then that will that's a direct um, contribution to our our efforts for reducing climate change and other environmental effects and saving energy for very important things. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. I also have a um, have a, a, a visions uh, to uh, to using these type of devices for the uh, um, to combining the deep neural networks uh, for the for the climate change issues and develop uh, energy materials, um, material discoveries uh, um, in the future. That's all along the lines of my two themes in, in the research lab. That is wonderful. And that's one of our uh, very much a priority for the university and for the, the province, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, if anybody has any questions for Professor Yu, uh, we can either um, you can contact him directly or we'll be able to uh, bounce the questions to him. I'm sure you're going to have a lot too. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Thank you. OK, and. Next on our list. Uh, apologies, here we go. Ah, and oh, to round out our uh, our workshop and our afternoon, uh, we're very happy to welcome uh, Professor Sylvain Saigi. I hope I'm saying that correctly from the University of Bordeaux. Uh, Professor Saigi is um, head of research, uh, head of the research group Architecture of Silicon Neural Networks, and um, let's see here. We welcome him to discuss the talk titled Towards an Energy Sustainable AI. So Professor Saigi, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay, then, okay, I'm a professor in University of Bordeaux and my background is about uh, chip design. Then uh, this presentation will be, uh, uh, we, we will have some overlap with uh, the previous one, but it's interesting because I'm not a chip, I, I, I'm not, fabricate memory store, but I use memory store for for um, for fabricate or design uh, neural networks. That next slide, please. OK, the 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 main issue is about the energy consumptions of AI. Everybody uh, are about uh, the um, the AlphaGo system where the the computer uh, wins against the best uh, players, but the first version of this uh, uh, AI uh, needs uh, the power uh, consumption of uh, 250 kilowatt and the, the, the game lasts two hours. And the equivalent for that to understand uh, uh, the problem is uh, the equivalent uh, for European car and then you use uh, the full uh, gas of, uh, of a European car. And then uh, after that, Google designed a second, uh, a second system with a TPU. I will detail a little bit later. 
and but the, the second version needs that you use your uh, microwave during two, 20 hours as the full uh, power. Next one, please. And the, there is another problem about the ICT. Uh, uh, currently, the ICT uh, use 7% of the world electricity consumption, and the forecast is between 20 and 50% in uh, a couple of years. Next one, please. And then we understand that it will be not uh, sustainable. Next one, please. For that, there is two problems. The first one is about the memory access that Professor Wu uh, explained previously with the von Neumann bottleneck. bottleneck. And the second one is about the power consumption, uh, the thermal dissipation in the, in the computer. There is uh, the, the figure, uh, the, the, sorry, the draw presents the uh, fre clock frequency of the computer uh, along the years. And then we see that uh, around 2000, 2005, we, we, uh, we, we are stuck around uh, one gigahertz. And the main reason for that is uh, the thermal dissipation. We reach 100 watts per square centimeter. That means it's, uh, this, this, uh, this figure is the same that for the, 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 in, the, in, the, in the kitchen for, for to cook the, the, the food. Then it's the maximum that we can dissipate in a, in a physical system. And then the idea is in the next slide, please. Okay, there is no video. Can you, next one, please? Sure, okay. Then. Do you see the video or not? We see alternative paradigm of computation, brain inspired, then a video, and then underneath is 100 billion neurons. Okay, then, okay, then, okay, there is no video for that. Then the idea is to, uh, to spread, is there is not a big, compute, uh, big computer, um, big processor on uh, memory in a, another play, uh, area in the, in the system, but to spread the, the, the computation in a smaller uh, unit, the neurons, and the link between the neurons is, uh, is a memory. And for that is synapses. And why it's important to, 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 to design some brain aspirate system? Because in our brain, we have, uh, uh, we have one billion of neurons, Okay, but the, f the frequency is very low, 10 Hertz to 100 Hertz, then you don't reach to, to you don't uh, expect to reach a very high frequency with a problem in, a, in, a, in electronics. And the last things, the main important things is about the power consumption. Your brain is about 20 Watt. And then with that, you can do some uh, very complex task for translation, recognition, synthesis, that for the computer is very, very expensive in terms of energy. Next slide, please. The problem of, uh, of power consumption uh, in the AA is not new because uh, Qualcomm designed a, a chip in 2013, the, the rot, but uh, they uh, they uh, they gave up with this uh, this, this chip. Uh, they prefer to use uh, some um, software solutions. In 2014, IBM uh, delivered the Trunos chip, and they used for the image recognition. The result was not very. Uh, 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 important for the for the vision uh, community because with software you can do the same things but it was interesting because we try to do the same things in that in software with hardware uh, with uh, less power consumption but the the three last uh, uh, chip uh, are now uh, used by by the scientific by by the community the first one is of course the tpu and I presented in the, in the first slide where they can reduce by a factor of 25 the power consumption for the same task, with a, uh, and then they implement FALGO in the on the TPU. And uh, Intel uh, produced the Movibius uh, chip in 2017, and now you can buy these uh, neural networks. It's uh, on a USB stick, 
then uh, you have a processor for the neural networks for artificial neural networks on the USB stick and the, uh, the low E uh, in the same year, but this one is spiky neural networks and then it's totally different and I, my, the, my, my presentation will focus on spiky neural networks, but all these chips are purely CMOS and there is a main problem this kind of uh, with the CMOS is about the learning is not easy to implement the algorithms. Next slide, please. And then uh, for the spike in your neural networks, you change the parading of the computation. It's an event-based computation. In uh, artificial neural networks, you have a su supervisor. Then you train your neural networks. So you, pre uh, um, you present some uh, some data and you you measure the output and uh, you try to reduce the error of the output. With the event-based computation, it's a bio uh, rule. For that, you have a presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic neuron. And if the event from uh, there is uh, a, before, if the presynaptic uh, neurons uh, spikes before the postsynaptic neuron, then it means that there is a, a causality between both. Then next, please. And then if the, there is a causality, you increase the, the synaptic weight. Next one, please. And next one. And if uh, the the events of the postsynaptic events, uh, postsynaptic neurons uh, uh, occurs before the presynaptic neurons, then the, the, that means you don't need the synaptic uh, link, uh, the synapses between both, and then you will decrease. Next one, please. And then you decrease the synaptic weight. You have the curve on, on the left. It's uh, it's it represents uh, the the rule with the LTP for potentiation and LTD for depression. Next one, please. Then we uh, we we had a collaboration with some colleagues in Paris where we can use a ferroelectric memory store. Then it's a different uh, uh, technology from uh, the. Uh, than um, in the previous presentation from Professor Wu. And then in the, on the, on the theoretic memory star, next one, please. We, we, uh, we success to measure the, the STDP that I present in the previous slide. Then you have the potentiation and depression uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, um, the device. Uh, in this presentation, I don't, I don't explain how we can drive the memory star uh, the ferroelectric memory store in the system because I have just 10 minutes for for the presentation presentation of my uh, my research work. Next one, please. But uh, I will show you a result about that. Uh, it's a very naive neural network. Huh? Uh, we use the MNIST. The MNIST is uh, composed of uh, six, uh, 60,000 pictures for the um, learning and 10 thousand pictures for the test. Each, uh, each number is draw with uh, 28 by 28 uh, pixels. Then for that on the left, you have uh, the 784 input neurons. And for the, uh, and for the output, you have just 100 uh, neurons. There is no hidden uh, uh, layer in this kind of uh, in our simulation, but in the simulation we use uh, memory store variability. Next one, please. Okay, then you have uh, 10 by 10 uh, green uh, boxes that represent the 100 output neurons, and in each uh, green box you have uh, 28 by 28 pixels that represent the the projection of the synapses on these uh, output neurons. And then you have to click uh, two, three, four, five times, please. Next one, next one, next one. One more, and one more, please. Yes, thanks. And uh, here you, you see that the, there is no uh, supervisor. It's just a local rule that I explained previously. Then you see that there is a, the system will find a solution. And then you learn the the number uh, for in the output neurons. Okay, then it was the preliminary, preliminary results. Sorry, and next one, please. 
And then uh, with these uh, preliminary results, we had a uh, uh, European project. Then now it's down uh, since, uh, yes, the, the final review was uh, two months ago. And uh, it's a ULPEC project. And then uh, I didn't present in this, uh, here the, um, the neuromorphic sensor because it's very important. We talk about the, the spike in neural networks based on event. Uh, computation, but for that we need some input. And uh, there is a, uh, our colleague in Paris, Prophecy. Then there is uh, the name uh, uh, on the left, uh, bottom left. And they designed the a camera, a spiking your network uh, camera. And we uh, in this project, it's part system integration that we implement on the same chip, the camera, the input and output uh, neurons. Spiking neurons, and on the top we report a crossbar of uh, 784 by 100 uh, synapses, and we will publish the results in a couple of months. Next one, please. But in our group, we don't uh, only work with the memory stick device. We are aware about. Uh, uh, all solution to implement uh, efficient energy uh, neural networks. And uh, it's a second European project. We start uh, one year ago. Uh, it's uh, in this, in this uh, project, we use uh, the Spintronic oscillators to realize some computation. And we have for that two, uh, two main ap uh, application. One is about the RF uh, uh, fingerprints with uh, Thales, and one is about the mammography, uh, because uh, with the uh, X-ray, the, the frequency of the X-ray is very close to the oscill spintronic oscillator. Then we try to combine the sensor and the neural networks, the computation on the same place. And please, the next one, the last one. And uh, at least in uh, Bordeaux, we have uh, the great project for Green IA. It's, uh, it's, it's focused on hardware, and in this project, we, uh, we, uh, we leave uh, the nanotechnologies. We will focus just on CMOS technologies, but the question is about the edge computing, where we want to compute close to the sensor. And for that, uh, we, we will use, uh, it, it will be dedicated to the digital embedded system. Then, uh, next one, please. Then in conclusion, um, we are. Um, you understand that I, I'm. Uh, we are. We designed the, the system for uh, low power uh, uh, IA, and for that we are. We can collaborate with uh, all the possibility for the technology. It could be memory store or uh, digital system uh, uh, as a usual system. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Professor C. That is um, a very. Uh, um, apropos of the general theme of this uh, uh, session. And um, so I did uh, mention a few uh, a few questions to Professor Wu. And um, I think uh, Professor Laurent Simon earlier, um, could you, so we, we do know about the importance of um, saving power and, uh, but still having very reliable um, um, devices uh, memory storage and things like that. Can you go into a little bit uh, about uh, the priorities in France uh, in this area with respect to not only computation and things like that, but also the um, environmental protection and perhaps how you see uh, a few differences here in North America? Would you be able to comment on something like that? Oh, I, sorry, I, I, um, I don't know. Um... Uh, about the the policy or in uh, North America about this point. Uh, Just talk about France, perhaps, and then we can make our own. Okay, uh, I th I think um, uh, it's n there is not a lot of people we are um, we take into account the power consumption in the IA. Not yet. It start um, uh, about the share uh, the great project. Uh, when uh, the uh, the French government uh, uh, launched the call for 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 the proposal of IA in France, uh, there was just one about the system. It's it's mine. It's my uh, project. Then the 39 uh, other projects are 
more uh, classical IA. Then uh, the problem is uh, in uh, on the other hand, uh, the um, the industrialist starts to work on that. There is Intel on on uh, IBM. They start ab about that, but there is not a lot of uh, uh, research group uh, who, who start to work on that. In France, so we are the community is small. Uh, I think maybe 10, 10 groups for for the France. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Segi, for joining uh, joining us Thanks. and your. Um, uh, a discussion of the, the the state of the research uh, in your group and in in your lab. Again, we cannot wait until uh, public health guidelines allows you to come visit us in person, and I will invite myself over <laughs> as well. Sure, thanks. Um, so this leads us to the final section of our workshop. I would like to invite. Um, uh, Professor Shushanta Mitra, the Executive Director for the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology, and also uh, Vijay Ganesh, Professor Vijay Ganesh, uh, the, the Executive Director from Waterloo AI, to say a few concluding remarks. Okay, um, thank you again. First of all, let me thank the organizers, uh, um, the real organizers. Lisa is the real organizer. Um, Sushanta and I came up with this idea of having a um, workshop on AI for science and engineering. And um, uh, Lisa just took it away. Um, and then there was this collaboration also with Bordeaux and it became a big event wherein you have Bordeaux, you have Waterloo AI, you have WIN, and a vast, you know, large number of researchers uh, presenting their work. Uh, I think this has been a very productive um, session where we've learned from each other about different ways in which AI can be applied in the context of science and engineering. And this field uh, of applications of AI to science and engineering is, is, is still very nascent and there's a long way to go um, and it will have a potentially a huge impact on um, science uh, and engineering going forward. So before that, we go oh, for yeah. I could just have to yeah. say that I could not have done any of this without um, Jacob and Vera as well. So they did a lot of the heavy sure. lifting and our co-op students and to my call uh, Harold and Oleg as well. So I will Absolutely. turn off my thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Vera, and thank you, Harold, if you're there. Uh, and also thank you to to the uh, Bordeaux team. Uh, they did a great job uh, helping us organize this and and all the professors and, and researchers who uh, um, talked about their work uh, here. So with that, I will stop and I'll hand it over to Sushanta. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vijay. Uh, really appreciated your kind words, and I think it was a real uh, terrific team effort between Wynn and Waterloo AI, and I think when two research institutes like us work together, I think that creates a uh, quite excitement in the community particularly in this aspect of use of machine learning, artificial intelligence for science and engineering, where I think in both sides there is a tremendous opportunity to work together and move our collaboration partnership, not only within our institute, but uh, we have seen through participation of University of Bordeaux, it uh, transcends our uh, boundaries of this campus and connects us internationally as well. Uh, and uh, our University of your Twente uh, colleagues. So we have also had a keynote from University of Twente. So I think this was a tremendous uh, uh, opportunity and we see this uh, growing forward. So uh, Vijay and I, we are committed uh, to put together a seed funding uh, to catalyze some of the partnership and collaboration and discussions that germinated through this workshop and hope to announce this uh, very soon. Uh, uh, certain we'll work uh, to make sure that uh, we have uh, the rollout to our community and uh, we will see further engagement through this seed funding opportunity. Uh, Vijay, you want to comment on anything on the seed funding? And how we yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, we will 
um, have a, a posting on this very soon to all our members and uh, at Bordeaux as well. And the seed funding will part of it uh, will come from Bordeaux, part from Waterloo and AI and Win, and of course for the respective um, research, researchers in the respective um, uh, institutions. And the idea would be to create uh, collaborative research opportunities. So the announcement will be made soon, and there will be a process uh, through which uh, a relatively straightforward application process uh, through which you can apply. And um, and you know uh, there will be a few of them that will be selected for for uh, for getting the funding so that you can uh, continue your research along along this line of applying artificial intelligence to science and engineering. With that, I will end. And thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye.